Good evening. I'm John Wenske, chairperson of the Shrewsbury School Committee, and welcome to our meeting for Wednesday, February 16th, 2022. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast live on Selco channels 29 and 329 and streamed live on Shrewsbury Media Connections website. Thank you to SMC Executive Director Mark Serra and Liz Poplowski for their assistance with this broadcast. Tonight's meeting will be rebroadcast between now and our next scheduled meeting on Wednesday, March 2nd. Uh, the first item on our agenda is public participation. We do have one resident tonight that requested to address the committee. I'd like to invite him to the standing mic uh, right there and uh, just introduce yourself, uh, name and address, and uh, you'll have up to five minutes to address the committee. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Sosa Paquette, and I live at 9 Meadow Lane, Shrewsbury, Mass. The reason I'm addressing the board tonight er, is today in the Shrewsbury High School and stuff they were doing... Um, Black Lives Matter um, things and stuff. The concern that I have and stuff is <laughs> that a poem and stuff was read out to the kids de depicting that police officers are predators and murderers of black children and black, black ch children and parents. One of the questions that I ask everybody here as I have a state police retired sergeant sitting right here, do we think it's appropriate that her 16-year-old daughter would be taught that her mother is a predator or a murderer. What are we teaching in our schools? How is this possible? Then you guys put out curriculum out to these kids. And I'm gonna give you some examples here. Telling them that, let's see, it is estimated that police kill more than four times as many black Americans last year than anybody else. Here's the facts. Does anybody on this board look at the facts? 1,017 people were killed by police last year. 117 of them were black. Does that sound like it's four times? What are you teaching our children? Did you teach our children that 534 police officers were killed last year? This year, in the last 30 days, 54 police officers have been shot and 11 have been killed. Did we bother to teach our children that? Does anybody on this board, including you, Dr. Sawyer, do you review the curriculum of what you're doing to our children? Suicide, anxiety, and depression are through the roofs. 38% up on suicide. Do you know who's doing it? It's our schools that are doing it. You are indoctrinating our kids. You're sending children home to their mothers so that they have to look at their mothers that they're a predator or they're a murderer because they're a police officer. Every single one of you is on this board should be ashamed of yourself. John, I came out and I endorsed you to stop the other lady that was just absolutely way too woke to sit on this board. And I trusted you and I went out through this community and helped get your seat and get you reelected. This is what I got you reelected for? I really... Does somebody actually want to answer us, or am I supposed to just sit here and go after one fact after another? Look at this one that you're giving to the high schoolers. You are depicting a picture of all lives matter, but what it's trying to say in their depiction is that a white person's house, the fire is being put out while the black person's house is being burned down. Is this what should be happening in our schools? I went to my son's school today at Sherwood because the principal wasn't there, although all the other, the assistant principal, everybody else, nobody wanted to talk to me about what was happening in my son's school today because the principal wasn't there. So again, are administrators there? Who's running the school and who is there to talk to parents if the principal isn't there? This is a big concern. Black history should be celebrated. But when we cross the line and indoctrinate our children and teach our children that police are murderers, are we, like, what is going on here? I cannot believe this is happening in Shrewsbury. I'm involved in three already school board recalls that we just won, and we're removing those people in Troughton, Dudley, et cetera. I've got 21 parents that are wanting to know when each and every one of you are up for re-election. And this time, I will put the 50,000 in into the school board 
races and stuff so that I can unseat every single school board committee person that is responsible for what you're doing. How do you look at her and tell her that her 16-year-old daughter is coming home and her mother is a murderer or a predator? Do we not have police officers' children in our classrooms? Of course we do. But of course, none of you are going to say a word. So I'm going to let all this curriculum out. I have the recordings of the kids of what was done at the school. We are going to release it out to the press. I am going to put the commercials out in Shrewsbury, coming out from me personally, and I am going to tell the parents exactly what just happened. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sosser. Parquet, appreciate the time. Okay. May I make a comment, Mr. Munsky? Uh, yes. Just to yes. clarify the record. Uh, let's just clarify a couple of things uh, regarding Mr. Sasapuckett's comments. Um, first off, and I'll just take this and just to clarify, in terms of Mr. Kelly as the principal at Sherwood Middle School, uh, my understanding is that you came at parent pickup today and asked to meet with the principal. Uh, the principal, well, we may have called the principal, but the principal, as I understand it, you spoke to one of the assistant principals, you wanted to speak to Mr. Kelly. I didn't get to speak to anybody, nobody. Okay, I'm sorry. So when did you contact Mr. Kelly? I left him a message. Then I went to pick Ryland up. Mm -hmm. He wasn't available. He wasn't in the school. Yeah, he was in a meeting at Oak Middle School. And nobody else, the assistant principal, et cetera, did not want to talk to me. Well, I, you know. So, but to, to say that. This I, is just as a general matter, of course, sir. You know, as much as office, when it's a non-emergency issue. For, I think, 20 minutes. I'm going to, um, can I speak now, yep. Mr. Sheriff? Yes, please. please. So we, we do want to go back. Parent, Mr. Kelly will be happy to meet with you as he's happy to meet with any parent. Uh, we don't meet with parents necessarily on demand when other things are already in progress and, and the no, school is with other things. No, I would parents when we're teaching our Excuse kids. Excuse me, that Mr. Puck, Mr. Sosa Puck, you've had your time. We'd like Dr. Sawyer to respond. Thank you. Thank you and so as, far as, as far as the, uh, and I want to be clear, this was the Black History Committee Student Group Assembly, the 21st Annual no parent can opt out because as read Mr. it over Sosa Paquette, the please. loudspeaker all through the school. So parents didn't even have the choice to opt out. Mr. Sosa Paquette, you're out of order. I'd like Dr. So I, order. I'd like Dr. Sawyer to finish his statement, please. Go ahead. I think it'd be better if I just make my report okay. uh, without being okay. interrupted. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Thank you. <laughs> The next item on our agenda is chairperson and members report. Colleagues, anything to share with us tonight? I do. Uh, Ms. Um, Heffernan, yes. I wanted to uh, just remark about a really lovely night last night at the high school for eighth grade parents, but um, I do also feel compelled to remind people I'm running for school committee. I'm very happy to be running for school committee, and I think that the people in this room work very, very hard, including many of the district administrators, to make sure that all of our kids have a really high quality education. Um, one of the examples of that uh, is an event last night at the uh, host at the high school for eighth grade students, rising eighth graders. I, along some many parents who who I have seen since kindergarten, they're having that experience of my kid is going to be in high school. Uh, and I thought the, the, the um, event was both incredibly well attended, uh, especially given where we are in the pandemic, uh, but also that it was a really excellent program. And I want to thank the administrators at the high school and all of the department chairs who spent their evening there to make sure they could explain the many, many um, opportunities that were there. I've had the opportunity to look at the program of study now multiple times sitting here it meant something very different when it was now an opportunity for me to see what my what my kiddo could experience and so i just really do want to thank them uh, and the leadership team for pulling off yet again another really successful event great thank you Ms. Heffernan. mr uh, winski if i might knowledge. as well i just want to take this opportunity to thank dr sawyer and our staff a minute ago we heard a lot of things that were specious and not true which the superintendent is going to respond to shortly but well, what we just saw was a rare, ugly public outburst. Unfortunately, I know that a lot of our staff have been subject to that sort of verbal abuse uh, in recent times. It is a very charged time in our culture and society. Uh, and I know that while it doesn't always happen on camera and doesn't always get attention, we have a lot of people working for us who are on the receiving end of disrespectful garbage like that. And I want to take a moment to thank everyone who tries to do the right thing and sometimes has to deal with things like that in the course of their day-to-day -day business. Uh, and please know that we as a school committee are here. 
we see you, we hear you, and we respect that you're, the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pouch. Any further comments? Okay, next item on our agenda is uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mr. Wonski. One moment. Uh, the first thing that was on my agenda this evening to speak about uh, regarding superintendent's report uh, was to make the community aware uh, that yesterday was National School Resource Officers Appreciation Day. Uh, I did send a message out to our staff uh, to recognize our two school resource officers, uh, Officer Mark Hester and Officer Sean Vallier, uh, for their ongoing dedication to the maintaining the safety of our schools and for the times they've very skillfully assisted us with various needs this year, everything from helping with traffic situations, which has been an issue this year, of course, uh, as well as using their expertise to help us navigate uh, certainly many more complex situations than that appropriately. Uh, I very much appreciate our partnership with the Shrewsbury Police Department, uh, which I believe, uh, as you know from a report earlier this year, is strengthened uh, by having the school resource officer program in place. Um, in addition to that, uh, I wanted to uh, commend uh, the Black History Committee students at Shrewsbury High School uh, who made a student-created uh, and student-led presentation today at Shrewsbury High School. Uh, this is the 21st annual uh, such event uh, at Shrewsbury High School, and it's something that uh, we are proud has become part of the fabric and culture of Shrewsbury High School over the years. Um, I was personally uh, in attendance this morning. Uh, I thought the students did an outstanding job uh, in terms of presenting a variety of uh, musical performances, dance, uh, some awards for a student writing annual writing contest regarding black history, a student art contest. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we are trying and, and are responsible and frankly by school committee policy, it is, it is students' right within the Shrewsbury Public Schools to study controversial issues. Um, the public comment earlier made a reference to a poem. Uh, I want to be clear that this is a poem that was written and performed uh, by a Shrewsbury High School student. Uh, it was uh, based on the murder of George Floyd. Uh, as I understood the poem in attendance, uh, it was referring to uh, the police officer who has been convicted of the murder of George Floyd. Um, in giving some thought and knowing uh, that since uh, that happened, there have been uh, some complaints lodged with the school uh, from parents who are concerned that their children uh, and particularly those uh, who are connected to law enforcement, uh, felt that the uh, poem uh, unfairly, uh, with a broad brush, painted police officers in a bad light. Uh, and in retrospect, uh, in thinking about listening to it, uh, I could see how some might come to that conclusion, and that's something obviously I doubt uh, that uh, was the intent uh, of the student. Again, it was a student performance uh, of a student-written piece. Uh, these are very difficult and complex topics. Um, it's something that I know Mr. Bazillo is considering uh, relative to some of the response that he received. Uh, but I can assure you uh, that uh, it continues to be, uh, unless the, it is changed, uh, the policy of this school district uh, to make sure that our students are being introduced to topics uh, that can be provocative uh, and where students are encouraged and uh, expected to form their own opinions uh, regarding current events uh, or issues that are that are uh, can make us all of us uncomfortable. Um, so, in terms of uh, you know the other pieces that were presented, I'm not aware of what those are, where they're from. Um, so, I really can't comment on those things. But I, I certainly was personally in attendance, and I, and I do want to commend um, the students involved uh, for uh, making sure that they were presenting their school community with a, a perspective uh, regarding uh, Black history. Uh, in, uh, in a variety of different ways uh, through different kinds of artistic expression. Um, it's something obviously that is concerning uh, anytime if someone perceives that the school is, has created something that's, uh, uh, they, they find troubling. Um, and as always, we are open to a dialogue with our parent community uh, in order to make sure that we understand what people's perceptions are and that we can respond uh, regarding what, uh, what's happening. Uh, but I, I think to, uh, the way that this was framed in the public comment uh, was not 
uh, what I experienced today when I was in attendance at, at this event. Um, so with that, I, I will, uh, that'll, that's, that's the superintendent's report this evening. Okay. Um, Ms. Fritz. Dr. Sawyer, it would be possible for the school committee to get a copy of that poem just so we have some um, better understanding of what it was since we had these public I can, comments? I'm sure we'll be able to arrange that. Great. Thank you. Any further comments or questions for Dr. Sawyer? Okay. Okay, moving on to the next item on our agenda is time scheduled appointment uh, regarding the state of the district and a report uh, from Dr. Sawyer who will share perspective regarding the current state of Shrewsbury Public Schools. Uh, the report uh, has been provided uh, to the committee uh, under separate cover uh, in advance of this meeting. Uh, with that, give it back to Dr. Sawyer. Thank you, and, and I will direct that because you, you have not received a copy of the report yet as I was hoping to finish it uh, today but was not able to. Um, but I do have some slides that I will share and, and some comments that I will make. Uh, and if you give me one moment to sure. connect to the screen. Uh, I couldn't help but be reminded when I was thinking about making this report uh, of the famous introduction to Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, uh, that it was the best of times and the worst of times. Um, and certainly I think all of us uh, over the course of the past year have seen uh, uh, the best of people and the worst of people. Uh, I think we certainly have seen uh, wisdom and we've seen foolishness. Uh, we've seen... Uh, things that uh, cause us to strengthen our beliefs, things that make us incredulous, um, and certainly uh, things that have, have shown the best of human nature and, and events that have shown the darkest side of human nature. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that we are grappling with in our society and certainly within our school district uh, is uh, the, the, how we can maintain uh, hope for better times ahead um, and recognize the great things that are happening now, despite challenges. Um, and yet, there is much uh, to be deeply concerned about uh, in terms of the well-being of our young people, uh, in terms of the health of our society. Uh, and uh, uh, what I think, uh, however, is within a strong community in Shrewsbury, and I, I anticipate and I am confident it will remain so, um, and that we will not allow this community to become uh, divided the way we've seen so many others uh, over the past couple of years. Um, from our report tonight, I'm just going to take you through a variety of headlines to sort of take you through what I think we're experiencing this school year. Um, and this actually goes back to last spring uh, because we had uh, a really uh, watershed moment uh, in the history of this community um, in terms of local government and how it's funded. Uh, where the, the taxpayers of Shrewsbury uh, came forward and said they were willing, uh, a majority of them were willing to make an investment in their town uh, to make for better municipal services and stronger schools. Um, and that has, and later tonight when we present the budget, uh, you will, uh, we'll just reiterate uh, what a much stronger and better situation we're in. Uh, the first year in memory where we're not at least thinking about whether we'll have enough money to maintain what we have, never mind the fact that we, we might have to make cuts and lay people off, that is not the reality this year. And that's a credit to the voters of Shrewsbury who stepped up and were willing to pay more uh, for qual the quality of life in Shrewsbury to be maintained and improved. Um, so that really began the year on a, on a very positive note in that sense. Um, we were in a really good place in the summer and then uh, the Delta variant came along and we were uh, put in a situation where there was a lot of uncertainty once again. Uh, where we'd be able to open our schools uh, full and in person as we uh, were not able to do until late in the previous school year. Uh, there were questions that abounded. Uh, there was a variety of action and inaction uh, from various uh, levels of government. And uh, you know, we were scrambling once again in August uh, to make sense of what was the best pathway forward 
and uh, ultimately came up with a plan uh, that thankfully has worked quite well uh, of meeting our goal of maintaining in-person full-time school uh, throughout this year, which has been critically important for our kids. Uh, but it was a challenge uh, to, to do that. And of course, you know, what, what people need to realize is that when uh, school districts are spending time on making you know, plans about how we're going to uh, mitigate the effects of a pandemic, um, there's a lot of other work that we typically would be doing that we don't have the time to do. There's an opportunity cost to all of this. Uh, but uh, I, I really want to give an uh, incredible amount of credit to our leadership team, to our faculty and staff, um, to our families, and ultimately to our students. Uh, this year has been a very successful year as a result of people's efforts, but it has been an extremely challenging one. Another real highlight, of course, uh, is, uh, I know Ms. Hayes is here this evening, wrote an article uh, that you see on the screen, <laughs> Uh, that uh, we opened the new Beale School. Uh, this is an incredibly, uh, it's just an outstanding facility for learning that's going to last decades for this community uh, that has really enhanced our ability to deliver education to, at our elementary level the way it should be. Um, not only at the new school, uh, but by freeing up space at all of our schools and reducing overcrowding and enabling class sizes to be what they should be. Um, so that is something that again was a real highlight um, uh, of this year and uh, made our, uh, the state of our district stronger indeed. At the same time, you know, there was uh, a lot of concern. Uh, what was the impact uh, of the pandemic on our students in terms of their learning? Um, there were a lot of articles early in the school year about, you know, what, you know talking about learning loss, uh, talking about students' academic achievement, how, how would schools be able to make up for lost ground? Uh, and I think that uh, our, our district has taken a prudent approach uh, where we are doing uh, what we can to assess where students are using our best professional judgment uh, of the kind of assessments we use on a routine basis, adding some new types of assessment that are, don't take a lot of time but provide us with a lot of data, the STAR assessment that Ms. Cloud has presented to you in the past, um, looking at last year's MCAS scores to, to see where we were and, and you know, not surprisingly, not as strong as previous years, but not, not a disaster either. Um, and with the understanding that you know, rushing to try to make up lost ground it was, is the exact wrong approach to be taking mm -hmm. uh, because what we need is stability and calm uh, and the ability for us to make sure that the good teaching learning is happening, meeting students where they're at um, and over time, making sure that we're building those foundational skills that are most critical um, and, and that uh, I, I am confident that given the quality of our educators, uh, given uh, their dedication, uh, that we will, uh, you know, students will get to where they need to be. Uh, but we're, we're, it's not a race. And I think that's just important to note. And, and it's, uh, it, it has been very challenging, of course, because different kids were in different places depending on their individual experiences over the course of the, of the pandemic. Um, I, I don't want to um, understate how challenging the school year has been for our educators and support staff uh, and, and for school leaders as well. Um, certainly, uh, just I, I think that something that was maybe surprising uh, to many uh, was that how difficult this year turned out to be. Um, and I think that was a bit of a... a a shift in, in thinking because I think after the previous year um, and a, a summer that was very low as far as COVID, um, people were anticipating a return more to normalcy. And I think the, some of the realities of, of the impact of, of the pandemic um, and then the ongoing issues with the, the Delta surge followed by the Omicron surge, um, you know, created a situation that has been very difficult. I think we also uh, did not anticipate uh, in, in retrospect you know, perhaps we should have, but uh, the extent to which student, uh, students uh, missing school as much as they did or missing normal school for as long as they did uh, just created a situation where student behaviors, uh, student socialization uh, was, was, had just been changed. Um, and schools had to spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year, uh, and I'll talk more about student mental health in a moment, uh, just getting back into what would be just typical routines that students would be used to from just having been in school for a number of years. 
and having been socializing in, in typical ways. Um, and it took its toll on teachers. And, and you know, we have put some, a variety of things into place to try to support our teachers. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, it is very, very challenging. Uh, we, we've had some support seminars we put in place for paraprofessionals, for our professional educators and our leadership group. Uh, we've had some webinars that Dr. Lazat contracted with an expert on burnout. Uh, one series of webinars just completed last week. There's another for people who wanted to take that opportunity during the school vacation week. Uh, they'll be coming up as well, perhaps some more in the spring. Uh, we tried to provide some more time in December to teachers uh, who felt that they were just, there was just a lot on their plates um, in a variety of ways. But it's, it's uh, despite all those things, it, it remains extremely challenging time right now. Um, adding to that um, is that we continue to have an epidemic of school shootings uh, across uh, the United States, uh, something that has unfortunately um, become part of what seems to be American culture more so than other places around the world. Um, and whatever reason that is, it's a reality that we have to deal with. Uh, we had another major shooting that received a lot of attention uh, back in December. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, whenever these things happen, people get on edge. Families get on edge, educators uh, are, in, and uh, understandably so. Um, and then, uh, you know, we as a school district had to uh, work through an issue where uh, a, a bullet was found just in a hallway at Oak Middle School um, that created more angst uh, for people, understandably. It was handled incredibly well by the Shrewsbury Police Department, their partners in the state police our staff, the leadership team at Oak. Uh, but you know, it's just, in and of itself, that would have been a challenging situation, but coming on the heels of this news, and, and of course news being amplified over and over again through whatever channel and streaming service and social media people are using, um, creates, even for issues, I mean, serious issues like this, obviously get amplified even more. Um, and things that maybe in, under previous times might have been more minor uh, get amplified into larger issues that, that cause people deep concern. Um, and that is a cycle that we, that we are uh, part of, uh, unfortunately, because we're part of the culture of, of the community and, and society. Um, at the same time, uh, early December, the US Surgeon General came out with an advisory. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing that a Surgeon General does when there is something that is seen to be as a very serious threat to public health um, along the lines of, uh, you know, Earlier, those of us are old enough to, to know, you know the real emphasis on the dangers of tobacco and smoking, uh, or you know, when the AIDS epidemic hit uh, in the 1980s. Uh, the, the current Surgeon General is being very uh, purposeful about talking about the mental health crisis among youth that existed prior to COVID um, and has been uh, exacerbated by it. Um, and we are certainly seeing that today. Uh, for sure, we've, we've had uh, a large number of hospitalizations of students for mental health issues. We've had a large number of referrals for emergency mental health services, uh, issues that students have that are not to that extent, but still challenging and getting in the way of them having a uh, positive and productive school experience. Um, and this is not something that's going to go away overnight when all of a sudden uh, things change, when masks are removed uh, or become optional or uh, COVID cases go way down or whatever it might be. Um, the, the impact and, and the situation, it, it's not only because of the pandemic and there are a variety of issues and I'm not an expert uh, relative to the clinical issues with it. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we have way too many kids who are struggling. Um, and that's something we have to pay attention to and you'll see in my budget presentation later, uh, it's something I think we need to invest more in, in working, working through and supporting our students. Um, apropos for this evening, uh, we saw on a national scale uh, a lot of issues relative to uh, public concern, uh, controversy over what schools teach and how they teach it. Um, and that is something that uh, became a big issue, particularly in the gubernatorial election in Virginia. Um, it spread to some other places. Um, and this is something that uh, we are seeing um, you know, mostly in other parts of the country uh, and uh, regarding uh, demands to censor books or, or pull them out of schools, uh, talking about you know, what teachers can and can't do in classrooms because 
it might quote unquote make someone feel uncomfortable. Um, and uh, you know, I have concerns as an educator um, thinking about the idea that uh, somehow we're, we're going to improve society by not teaching kids about difficult subjects. Uh, by all means, we should be thoughtful about students' age level and maturity level, depending on what that is we're teaching and how we're teaching it. Um, I have great faith and trust in the educators in Shrewsbury uh, to make good decisions about that. Uh, but I think it's just important, and my hope would be, that unlike some other areas uh, of the country, uh, we do not see uh, that kind of uh, divisive situation here in, in our own community. Uh, similarly, a lot of this was under the umbrella of what is uh, known as critical race theory. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of, uh, we've had very little uh, communication in, in to, to our district in terms of my office or our principals around this. Again, it seems to be more of an issue other places. Um, what we can say is that we certainly have a strong commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion and belonging, um, as we should as the public school district that accepts all students, is responsible for the education of all students, and is responsible to making sure that all of our kids uh, feel welcome and unconditionally accepted, no matter who they are or what they look like. Um, and that we also are responsible for teaching uh, the facts about current events, the facts about history, um, and doing so in a way uh, that, again, is thoughtful uh, and uh, makes it clear uh, you know, around helping kids, again, able to be able to form their own opinions uh, regarding uh, you know, important key issues uh, in the world. Um, you know, we are not interested. Uh, in indoctrinating anyone. Uh, that's not the purpose of, of education. If anything, it's the opposite in the sense that we are teaching our students to think critically um, about what information they get, what the source is, um, and uh, using sound reasoning skills to come to a conclusion that they believe is right. Um, as we headed into uh, Thanksgiving and uh, holiday season, uh, we were hit with the Omicron surge. Uh, we had a, a significant number of, of cases, unlike we'd ever seen before during the pandemic. Um, our nursing staff did an incredible job handling this and working through it. Uh, the good news is, thankfully, uh, that although there were many more cases, uh, we ha have not had uh, any student hospitalizations that we are aware of. Uh, we've had one staff hospitalization for a short period of time. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, you know, it, the, the main disruption was just so many absences from school among students and among staff. Um, it was hard to maintain the kind of stability and learning that we would hope for. Mm -hmm. uh, but thankfully, and you'll see from the upcoming report, you know, the, we're, we seem to be on the other side of the surge um, and uh, things have definitely stabilized to, to a larger degree. Uh, one key piece of that that we've addressed over the course of the year are staff shortages, substitute shortages, as you can see from this headline. Um, and uh, you know, teachers generally, um, paraprofessionals, we've been shorthanded all year. Um, it is a very, very difficult economy in pretty much every sector in terms of hiring, uh, in, in regardless of what the level is, uh, but um, that is something that uh, ha has definitely had an effect on our ability uh, to be able to provide the level of service we want to provide on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, people are, are doing incredible work to try to work around and be innovative in how we deploy staff, particularly in our special education leadership team, <coughs> excuse me, and they, and they deserve uh, kudos uh, for just the amount of time and effort they're putting into trying to make sure we have as much stability for kids on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but it has been an enormously challenging uh, situation. And that brings us to this evening. Uh, and you'll be having a conversation in a bit uh, about mass mandates. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the, as, the, as the saying goes, the only constant is change. Uh, we are certainly continue to work through um, issue after issue that unfortunately does not involve the direct benefit of our students in terms of focusing on teaching and learning and, and the kinds of things we try to do in a school district. Um, there are other things that are that taking time and attention that are obviously important. Uh, but again, that opportunity cost where we're focusing on uh, these other elements that the pandemic has brought to our doorstep uh, over and over again. Um, and like most things, it seems, uh, during this, this uh, time period, uh, there is not 
a clear cut, certainly not unanimous, uh, not even necessarily uh, achieving consensus among some of the experts, uh, you know, leaving us at the local level uh, to try to make uh, sense of what's going on and, and make the best determinations and decisions we can uh, for the benefit of our students and our school communities. Um, so again, this is uh, just ongoing change that we continue to, to cope with. Um, and you know, our hope is that uh, if we truly get to the other side of, of this uh, piece, and especially as the spring weather comes, uh, we will be spending less and less time dealing with pandemic issues directly and, and dealing more with the educational aspects of how we can support our students um, who are certainly have been affected on the whole. Uh, we have lots of students who are thriving. Uh, we have lots of students who are doing perfectly well um, despite the challenges and have been incredibly resilient. Uh, but we have many who, who are definitely struggling in a variety of ways and that's something that is not going to, we're not going to flip a switch and have that change overnight. Um, so that's something that has to be on our mind and in the forefront uh, going forward with the work that we do. So with that, uh, this was going to be my concluding slide. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a blank slate. Um, what I would suggest that people visualize there um, are the absolutely terrific things that are happening in classrooms and in our schools every day. Uh, just, if you did not see the piece of uh, you know, surgical cloth over students' faces, uh, in, in most cases when you visit our classrooms, you would have no idea that we're in a pandemic. Uh, teaching and learning is happening. Our teachers are doing dynamic things with kids. Uh, we, we are seeing kids who are happy. I just had the opportunity recently to spend a lot of time at Oak Middle School because we're in the midst of a principal search. And it was business as usual. Mm -hmm. Kids doing science labs with their microscopes. Kids who were uh, acting out various things because of, a, of a particular book they're reading in their English language arts class. Kids working in small groups solving the math problem of the day. Um, there, there is some really, uh, again, I, I could not be more proud uh, of the quality of the education that our educators and our support staff provide to our kids every day. And I want to be sure that those who are listening know that that's what's happening in our schools. We're not on pause because things are hard right now. Uh, we're being judicious about how hard and how fast to push kids in certain directions or academically as we make sure we're trying to get them on a, on a good, solid footing. Uh, but, it, it, you know, we're not uh, relaxing standards in the sense that we expect a lot of our kids. Uh, we expect them, uh, be, and we know they need to, uh, have high levels of learning in order to be, have the choices they want to have in their lives going forward as we look ahead and think about the vision of our portrait of a graduate. Um, so I, I would conclude by saying, um, despite the many challenges in front of us uh, and, and the many uh, uh, issues that are detracting from our focus on being able to provide the best education we can. Uh, we are in, we, we have a strong school district. The state of the school district is, is strong. That said, we have a lot of kids who are struggling. We have a number of staff who are struggling. We need to keep finding ways to support them. Um, and uh, as we get to the other side of the pandemic, we will have more ability, hopefully, uh, to be able to um, address uh, these, these key issues. And, but in doing so, uh, it will be critically important for us to remain uh, connected and united as a community uh, in service of doing the absolute best we can uh, for the young people uh, of this town. Um, so I, I don't have any wonderful closing piece because this is what I've got. But uh, I hope that takes you for a little bit of a uh, a tour of where we've been over the past year. Um, I remain hopeful and optimistic, uh, but also realistic and pragmatic uh, that we, there's much work to do, uh, but there's no place I'd rather do it, and uh, I wouldn't want to do it with any other staff or, or community of parents, and certainly, as far as I'm concerned, the best kids around. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Um, colleagues, questions or comments? Just a comment. Um, I've been doing this for a really long time, <coughs> as you all know. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> oldest one. And I, you know, what Dr. Sori said, how challenging these past two years have been, and this year even more so than mm -hmm. I think any of us anticipated that it was going to be that, that challenge was going to keep going. And 
in light of the comments made at the beginning of today's meeting, I just want to thank all of Dr. Sawyer's staff. The amount of time and effort that goes into running a school is difficult enough, never mind during a pandemic. We used to think that the budget was our hardest thing. We know that's really not the hardest thing anymore. And, you know, I think we've had a lot of good things happening, um, but the, this tale of the pandemic is going to go on for a long time. And we are pivoting and changing, but that would not happen without the leadership that we have in this district. Um, so going forward, I think there's struggles, there's stress, but there's a lot of really good things happening. And, you know, I know f this board is very dedicated to public education and student services, and that would not be happening in this district if it wasn't for Dr. Sawyer and the leadership of all of this staff, the students, families, everything. So it is a good news story in a bad time. You know, we're, we're just fortunate to be in this district, and I know my children went through it and are doing well. Um, I don't know how families have gone through the pandemic, but I think without uh, your leadership, we wouldn't be where we are. So thank you very much. and. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but we'll keep doing it. Great. Any further comments or questions? Mr. Pouch. I just want to thank Dr. Sawyer for the presentation, which was unorthodox, certainly for a state of the district report, but perhaps befitting of the times. Mm -hmm. um, I think before the pandemic, we frequently saw that our K-12 public schools were a place where unaddressed issues in society were washing up on our shores. Because what are, you, what are you doing in a K-12 school district? You're educating kids, you're meeting the needs of kids, and when there are societal needs that are not getting met, when there are needs at home that are not getting met, kids show up at our doors with those challenges and we have to work with them to address that. Pre-pandemic, it's always been the case that schools have been a place where problems in our broader community show up. And in the last two years, I think that that has been amplified to a great degree. We are seeing so many challenges in our broader society walking through the doors of our school district. Uh, and I just have to say that I have endless respect for the staff who are working so hard through it all to make sure that we are prioritizing the needs of our kids, mm -hmm. make sure that we're prioritizing learning for our kids, to make sure that our kids can come out of some of the worst times and challenges that we could think of with having learned something, having been resilient, having been provided with coping skills, having had their needs met in one way, shape, or form, uh, that we can help make their futures better. That is the role of our schools. Uh, all of our staff have been really dedicated to that. I think that everybody in the past two years, we can all think of our own lives, we've all had a few ungracious moments, to put it kindly. Uh, and I look at our professionals who work in our buildings, and they manage to every day prioritize the needs of kids. Uh, I am not an educator by profession. I couldn't do that job for 10 minutes. Um, I am endlessly impressed with the dedication of everyone who does this work. I think that Shrewsbury Public Schools, despite having challenges uh, in the past, in the present, and in the future, has weathered the storm relatively well, and that is because of the people who put in this work every day, day in and day out. And in particular, I want to thank, actually, and I don't say this enough, I want to thank our students um, whose resilience through all of this uh, gives me a lot of hope uh, for the future. Any further comments, Ms. Heffernan? Yeah, I um, would echo my, my colleagues completely and appreciate, in many ways, going back to the, the tale of two cities of sorts, right, of, the, of, of where we are. Um, and while they, the challenges are incredible and the societal challenges and the, the challenges, as was mentioned, um, for our staff day in and day out, um, I do think that some of what was mentioned tonight gives us a bit of a path forward uh, as, we, as we start to begin a budgeting process, as we start to figure out where do we invest, what do we, what do we need to work on. The, the, the challenges before us in, in some ways could never be clearer. Um, and so I think, I think that helps us as we try to figure out where, where to go. Um, the times, I appreciate that we began with a, you know, the, the positivity of, of passing the operational override in this town and that actually giving us the ability to address some of the needs that um, are, are really rising. And, uh, and so I, I, in many ways, um, knowing the challenges that have been in, in my house, Sandy, with, with three kids over the last couple of years, they're real. And I appreciate all of the parents who have sort of stuck with us and know that there are many parents who with every one of these meetings, thinks that we should have made a different decision on any given night, um, and so, and I'm sure tonight will be will be no different as well. Um, but, uh, but I think I think the people in this room care an awful lot about the kids in this district and the staff in this district, um, and I hope that we can continue to find ways to invest in them. Thank you. Um, I 
also echo the sentiments of my colleagues. I will say I've been through seven of these uh, State of the District uh, uh, reviews. I think the last three years in particular, the last three or four years, we've, we've been kind of laser focused on the challenges, the financial challenges and the unpredictability that we had um, and kind of focused on where we needed to cut uh, it is a good news story uh, from the respect of the override and the, you know, the voters uh, that, uh, that made that happen. Um, certainly, uh, what's happening in our schools is, is outstanding uh, from our senior leadership team uh, to our educators, staff, school nurses, all of whom have had to wear many different hats over the last two years in addition to their day jobs. Uh, everybody has done exceptional work. Uh, appreciate uh, also the, the perseverance of our students and uh, certainly our families uh, who have exercised certainly patience, flexibility, and grace throughout. Uh, we're a very lucky district in that respect. Um, so, uh, so thank you to everybody and thank you for the report. Dr. Sawyer, any, any further comments? No, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is also a time scheduled appointment. It is the district response to the pandemic and I'll hand it back to Dr. Sawyer. Thank you, I'll pull these slides up on the screen. And I'll present the information. Uh, Ms. Freeman is here. If there are any questions that she can answer that I can't. Uh, but this is the same report we've been providing uh, throughout the year, reminding everyone that our primary goal is to keep kids in school full time, minimizing those disruptions while we minimize uh, the risk of contracting COVID-19 through mitigation strategies. Uh, the approach we're taking is to focus on mitigation strategies first and foremost around maintaining our students' health as far as their mental health and emotional well-being, working hard to create a sense of belonging um, that supports them, and then providing learning opportunities uh, that support their academic needs. This is a good news story. The seven-day positivity rate is down to 3.3%. Uh, this is now uh, the fifth lowest in the U.S., uh, but it had trended up much higher, of course, during the surge, uh, but this is the seven-day average that's reported each day by Johns Hopkins. You can see how that's trended over time uh, from December, mid-December uh, through uh, early January after the school vacation period. Uh, and the holidays, this is overall not just students, of course, this is all of Massachusetts um, and trending now, now below that 5% threshold that the World Health Organization uh, recommends as a benchmark. This is the cases by age. Um, Major reductions uh, compared to the January 31st report, uh, there were uh, 24,500 plus students from birth to age nine uh, with cases. Now that's only a third of the amount, about 8,500, for ages 10 to 19. Similarly, down from over 26,000 cases statewide to just over 8,800. Uh, that's over the two week uh, period uh, last reported by the state. So numbers are coming down. Hospital admissions rates also similarly uh, changing from, <coughs> excuse me, in late January, uh, averaging 15.6 per 100,000 for kids up to 11 years old, and it's down to seven. Uh, it was 11.2 for age 12 to 17 years, that's now 4.4. And for 18 and 19 year olds, uh, it's gone from uh, 14, uh, I'm sorry, 14.4 there to down to uh, only six per 100,000. So a very small number of hospitalizations and anecdotally in communicating with our school physician, Dr. Gibson, who's a hospitalist, a pediatric hospitalist at UMass, uh, indicates that they've really seen a very large downturn uh, in number of, of juvenile cases. They initially saw a few cases uh, that were more related to directly to COVID. Uh, interestingly, he said that it seemed to be uh, mainly unvaccinated uh, male adolescents uh, who typically uh, were overweight. Uh, that seemed to be the, the profile they were seeing. And then they saw a wave of young, uh, sort of toddler age children or, or younger uh, with sort of croup symptoms uh, as a result of having COVID. Uh, but that really seems to have dissipated. Um, referring back to my previous report and what we'll be talking about in the budget, what they are seeing is they're seeing uh, mental health admissions at UMass like they've never seen before in young people. That is, that is what he is most concerned about. Uh, in terms of the status right now of young people's health. 
Locally, they're just showing the number of student cases we've had over the last few weeks versus overall cases for the town. Uh, and uh, again, those numbers are trending down sharply. Um, on a percentage basis, last week, uh, the number of cases we had among all of our student population was uh, seven tenths of 1% uh, tested positive last week. Um, and then this week so far, it's about one tenth of 1%. So again, very small percentage of students right now who are testing positive for COVID. Locally, this is a, a trailing, obviously, a 14-day benchmark, so it's a little bit higher, but uh, it's trended down from uh, what it was previously, a little over 7%, the last state reported number. As far as this week, uh, we've had 12 cases reported so far since Saturday. Um, cumulatively, uh, puts us over a little over 1,800. And uh, you know, we, we did stop contact tracing in January when we switched to the symptomatic testing program. Uh, you know, we assume there, there could be some transmission in schools, although the numbers are very low right now. And most often we can make a connection to a family positive case or an outside of school situation. Uh, but we, we continue to try to monitor that the best we can. As far as uh, vaccination statistics, uh, you can see this is the percentage of cases uh, among those who are vaccinated or unvaccinated or who were uneligible at the time among students. Um, and you can see those statistics there. Uh, but we also have a, a new statistic to show you this evening and displayed a little bit differently. Um, this is among students. Uh, total number of students who have tested, uh, or rather who are vaccinated on the left is the blue. And of those vaccinated students, 19.6% uh, of them have tested positive. This is age seven through 12, or grade seven through 12 rather. So they were eligible for vaccination even before the school year began since last spring. Um, and then you see among those who are unvaccinated in grades seven through 12, um, the number of cases, it's about 35% uh, who have contracted COVID over the course of the year. For staff, uh, the vast majority of our staff are vaccinated, of course, um, over 1,100. Uh, of those, about 20% have had you know, what we term a breakthrough case um, over the course of this year. Uh, of the 44 staff uh, who have worked for us over the course of this year, not all of whom are here. Some may have worked for us and left the district at one point or another. Uh, but over the course of the school year, we've had 44 different staff working for us who are not vaccinated. Um, and of those, uh, we've had 34 cases. So 77% of our unvaccinated staff have contracted COVID. Just a reminder, we publish our dashboard every Monday. This is just a screenshot of what uh, it looks like on the, the website right now. We had 54 cases last week. This shows cases by day, just to get a sense, you can see the big spike, of course, uh, in late de uh, or December into late December, early January. This is on a day by day basis. Uh, we actually had our first day of zero cases in quite some time uh, yesterday, uh, which was, uh, uh, makes me optimistic. Um, and this you can see by a week going through the end of last week. And based on the number we have so far this week of only 12, we would expect that number uh, to come down even further uh, with next week's report. This is just our by school case. Um, you know, high school being the largest school, of course, but you can see just across the different school communities what our numbers are. To get a different kind of snapshot of the district, you can see it by grade. And you can see right now, actually, uh, some of the lower upper elementary and lower middle school grades are where we've had our highest case numbers at this point. So that over the course of the Omicron surge, that seems to be the age group that was testing positive more frequently. This is just a, showing the difference between student and staff cases overall. Um, this is, again, some vaccination data uh, in terms of where we're at. Um, this is the data that's provided by uh, the state relative to all children who live in the town of Shrewsbury at these age levels, most of whom go to attend our schools, of course. Uh, and you see right now we're at 57% of fully vaccinated among 5 to 11-year-olds, 92% among 12 to 15-year-olds, and 93% among 16 to 19-year-olds. Uh, for booster doses, uh, about half now of our 16 to 19-year-olds have had a booster dose and about a quarter of our students ages 12 to 15. This is data that we take out of our school health record, uh, which is, uh, so these are just our students. 
uh, and uh, there are some that won't show up because their uh, families are not allowed sharing when it goes into the va uh, vaccine database. Uh, but this is uh, uh, two students who have had at least two doses in each of the grade levels. So you can see in our uh, K through four, and we're running about 55% or so, a little higher with fourth grade. Uh, when you head into the Sherwood grades, you're over 60%. Uh, into Oak, you've got 74 and 80 percent, and then 80 to 87 percent in the high school, different age uh, grade ranges. Uh, these are posted every. It's a little harder to see on the screen. I'm sure these are posted, uh, you know, under the school committee materials each uh, uh, Thursday after our meeting. Uh, but you can see just some comparison points, comparison to surrounding towns, similar uh, what we've seen in previous weeks in terms of the uh, vaccination. A couple of towns. Uh, stronger for the younger students, uh, with now over 95 percent, uh, for example, in Southboro, um, 84 percent in Westboro, 79 percent in Northboro, where we're only at 57 percent for our 5 to 11-year-olds. Uh, but that's uh, similar to where Boylston is at 54 percent and uh, uh, trending ahead of where Grafton is at 41 percent. Uh, this is an update on testing. Uh, you know, we're using our centralized testing site uh, to provide rapid antigen tests for symptomatic individuals. Uh, it has to be approved by our school nurse team. Uh, they sign a consent. We started doing this in mid-January. Uh, so far, 177 people have taken part in that testing, 27% uh, of whom were positive. Although, since February 7th, uh, 30 people have tested there and none of them have been positive. Um, so again, uh, a promising trend relative to the uh, amount of uh, virus that seems to be in the community right now. We continue to do the surveillance pool testing or safety testing. About a quarter of our students and staff participating. Uh, we've had 301 positive results out of 28,000. Um, so it's a, running at a 1% positivity rate for those participating. We also introduced at home surveillance testing using rapid tests. Um, and these are distributed uh, every other week. Students receive theirs today. You get two in the kit. You use one this week, one next week. Um, I, I should mention at this point that we'll be sending out some uh, an advisory. Uh, we're going to be asking our students and staff uh, who are participating in the rapid test surveillance program um, to hold uh, their test next week during the school vacation week. Um, that typically we ask them to test on Wednesday afternoon or evening. Uh, we're going to ask them to hold it till the Sunday morning prior to coming back. So we can capture as many potential uh, infections that may have happened over the school break, uh, similar to what we did after the uh, December vacation. As far as absenteeism, um, that's coming. That's become much much stronger. We're down to about 3.3 percent, which for this time of year is excellent. Um, so we're really back into more of a normal mode in terms of how many students are out, regardless of what the illness might be. Um, you can see that there on that uh, bar graph. As far as staff absences, uh, that's certainly dropped down to a much lower level as well. Um, and right now only about a tenth of the staff absences are due to COVID. So that's been a big change from uh, when the surge happened, about half of the staff who were out was due specifically to COVID. And again, you see that displayed here in terms of absentee rates and in the red absentee due to COVID. Um, this is a new uh, display uh, that's uh, to inform your conversation this evening, uh, showing cases before and after vacations. This is last school year, 2020-2021. Uh, so you can uh, the, the blue bar is the week prior to a vacation period. The red bar is the week immediately after, and the gold bar is two weeks after. Um, so you can see Thanksgiving was trending up. That was Thanksgiving of 2020. Uh, Winter vacation 2020 at the new year of 2021. Um, you see the cases were went up a bit over the break, came down in the second week. Uh, February vacation, we were in a much lower case environment. It actually went down four cases last February um, after the break and then popped up a bit to the same level, but again, at, at pretty low numbers. And then by the time April came around, we had a very low number of cases in the district at that time. Um, so really, you know, a fairly de minimis uh, number there. Um, in terms of this year, uh, Thanksgiving vacation, uh, you see the numbers uh, there week prior, week after, and two weeks after. And then, you know, what's been our 
most dramatic spike in cases, uh, which was uh, the Omicron surge from 45 just prior to the December vacation to 445 um, the week we came back, uh, which trended back down to 361 the week following and has been trending down since, thankfully. Um, just a reminder of all the reasons why we think it's important to keep schools open, especially around students' mental health and their social and emotional well-being. Uh, I mentioned about levels of hospitalization, which we've not had any student hospitalizations and one staff hospitalization. Thankfully, it was uh, minor and they were discharged after a short stay. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're keeping our schools open, especially um, given the uh, numbers we're seeing of students with very serious uh, mental health concerns. And of course, remote learning itself being a disruption. Um, I mean, right now, the conversation is really not about remote learning, uh, as we know, and that's good that we're kind of past that point where people are concerned about that. And again, primary goal is to keep kids in school and uh, serve them well. And uh, we'd be happy to hear your comments or answer any questions for you at this time. Thank you very much for the report. Uh, any comments or questions, Dr. No, Mickey. excellent report. I'm, I'm thrilled to see all of these dissections that you do. It provides a lot of information. I'm uh, wondering about the vaccination rate that is reported for the town as a whole, which is very good in the 90% range for many of our age groups, versus what you've captured from the uh, vaccine reporting system, which I believe is limited by the fact that some parents haven't granted permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then there's there was another statistic that you had, I believe another slide where you were reporting the number of positive cases in the school system among students and staff mm -hmm. versus, you know, whether they were vaccinated or not. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like you're, the information is coming from three separate pools there. And yeah, to, to some degree, yeah, I, I can have uh, Ms. Freeman help me with it a little bit. I think you're, you're, you're as I mentioned, you know, what's in our, our student record system that gets passed through the state vaccine uh, database yeah. Um, you know, some people do opt out of that. And, and of course, uh, although we have the vast majority of students in Shrewsbury attending our schools, it's not all of them. You know, there's a number of students who attend private schools as well. And, and so right. we, do, we, don't, we don't capture the entire universe. Um, so a couple of those things may, are creating that perhaps. Um, as far as the, you know, we have not uh, asked families to directly provide us with evidence of vaccination yeah. unless... Um, we asked them the question if their child tests positive. Mm -hmm. uh, then, so that so that statistic about uh, the number of actual cases we've had, um, you know, it's very rare that we're not able to, to determine whether someone's been vaccinated. But I don't know if you have anything, Noel, that you would add to that. Right. So when we were contact tracing, we actually asked that question more often: yeah. Is your child vaccinated? Because yeah. that determined whether or not they needed to test and stay or quarantine, um, or not at all if they were vaccinated. So. Um, we don't actually ask a, with every positive case because it, whether you're positive, whether you're vaccinated or not, does not affect yeah. what you do if you test positive. Um, so that that um, we rely on what we have in our health records, um, and like Dr. Sawyer said, we have not asked everyone to turn in their vaccine records because to this point we haven't really needed to have that level of information on everyone um, because it's not required for school entry. Um, and that is when we typically ask for the documentation is when something is required to be in school. Are we asking for permission to access the vaccine registry for all students in general because of you know other things or is this a COVID related request? So the, we don't ask parents for permission to access the vaccine registry. That's something that happens on the pediatrician side or the wherever they might have received their vaccine yeah. because those are the people who are putting the information into the registry. Yeah. Our electronic health record has the ability to interface with the immunization, the state immunization system and pull that data. So that is all based on factors kind of outside okay. of our control, whether or not we have access to that information. Um, there are also times when if a student's like we recently had a student who we knew had received the vaccine, but it wasn't pulling from the immunization system. And when we did a little bit um, more looking into that, it was because the date of birth was off 
on one mm -hmm. uh, on the MIIS record. Mm -hmm. So if it's not an exact match, it won't pull. So if someone has more than one last name, for example, and they you know, use one version of their name for school and a different version of their multiple names for the pediatrician, then those don't line up. So there, it's not always about parent permission, but it's just, it's not, we like to acknowledge that it's not a perfect interface. We don't get 100% of the information all of the time. I guess what's occurring to me is is that I, I would guess ninety percent of the of the children in Shrewsbury go to public school. Would you say that's a reasonable? That's guess? A fair. Yeah. That ballpark ninety. Yeah, that's fair. So, uh, you know, when they say the community as a whole has a, a ninety percent vaccination rate in a particular age group, it's pretty hard for it to get down to sixty percent uh, in Shrewsbury schools. Uh, if we've got 90% of the students. And, and so I have a feeling, I, just I, I, my sense is there's not a huge amount of value to using that statistic where your denominator is the number of students and your numerator is very limited to a subset of people who have granted access to the vaccine registry. It's, I, 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 I yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you know, where we're, we're, you know, it's saying 90, you know, percent plus and it's sort of high school age and we're seeing 87 percent so it's yeah. not that different there maybe a little bit less for nine and ten maybe a little bit different percentage there i think where it's more like the 60s are where the, the, the students were just introduced to the vaccine more recently mm -hmm. uh, but yeah but the point's well taken and it's not it's not perfect data yeah uh, by any means but uh you know i think the the good news is it's trending upwards trending up. further yeah. and, you know that's what I just to me, the design of it is such that it doesn't add clarity to the whole equation. If, yeah. You know, we almost learn what we need to from the town-wide data. Mm -hmm. My two cents. Further comments, questions? No. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the report. Dr. Sorry, I think it continues to be a public service uh, to inform the public as to where we are uh, as a town uh, from uh, COVID data uh, that we're seeing. So, and it's good to see the numbers trending in the right direction. So thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a time scheduled appointment. Uh, it is a uh, the COVID-19 uh, mitigation and mask mandates discussion and potential vote. Uh, just some, for some background for the public, Governor Baker and Commissioner Riley decided recently to lift the Department of Education uh, statewide mask requirement effective February 28th. Our district is currently subject to five separate ma mask mandates. Uh, again, the Department uh, of Education statewide mandate, which will expire February 28th. Um, the second being the town-wide public mask mandate instituted by the Shrewsbury Board of Health, which applies to all schools in Shrewsbury. Uh, the third, uh, the district mask mandate instituted by the school committee uh, prior to the start of the school year on August 18th. Uh, and the fourth being the Federal Department of Transportation mask mandate that applies to all persons riding school buses and the fifth mass mandate is the uh, Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association mandate for indoor athletics, which will also expire uh, effective on February 28th. Um, I do know I was in attendance yesterday at the Shrewsbury Board of Health uh, meeting uh, talking about this topic, and we do know that they deferred their decision on school masking to their next meeting on March 4th. Um, so with that, uh, I guess we'll get started with, with Dr. Sawyer. Sure, thank you. Um, and uh, just to further clarify for those who are uh, watching, and we've tried to communicate this in a couple of communications to the community, uh, you know, we've, we've been subject to essentially five different mask mandates um, at this point concurrently. Uh, and you mentioned many of them, Mr. Wensky, uh, I think sort of in chronological order, I guess, in terms of they came, in, came into being. I don't know exactly when the, the Federal Department of Transportation, um, it is actually a, a executive order from the CDC that all federal transportation, and they explicitly included school buses, uh, that people who are on those buses must mask. Um, and that has not expired yet, it's been extended, um, and that's something that uh, you know, we have no local control over. Uh, so students and drivers of school buses, uh, anyone who's on a school bus until that such time as the federal uh, government uh, changes that uh, or, or subject to that mandate. Uh, in terms of, uh, you mentioned the MIAA, the Mass Interscholastic uh, Athletic Association, uh, they instituted a, a mandate for their contests. 
um, by uh, they've decided to let that expire effective February 28th and they were very explicit that that means it goes into whatever the local rules are uh, and whether those local rules are set by the school district or the local board of health um, and it, that, that could be different from different communities uh, that's what will be the controlling factor at that point um, in terms of the uh, uh, how many is that three two uh, mm -hmm. we've got uh, uh, the mask mandate or had the mask mandate from the state department of elementary and sector education um, but in, in august prior to that you the shrewsbury school committee uh, determined as part of the mitigation strategies for the school year that we're currently in that was beginning last uh, late last august um, that there would be uh, a requirement for masks in our schools. Uh, shortly thereafter, the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education instituted their mandate for the state, um, and that uh, that mandate over time um, had some flexibility if local districts wanted to apply for a waiver if they had a vaccination rate in a school that was 80% or greater, um, they could uh, apply to be mask optional. A handful of school districts around the uh, state did that. Uh, but once the Omicron wave hit, they all backed off on that, is my understanding. Some have reinstituted at this point. Um, but they have uh, made the decision recently, um, as was mentioned, that uh, that mandate will be rescinded from the state level uh, as of effective February 28th with no longer any kind of stipulation about vaccination rates or anything like that. It just becomes back totally to local control. Um, as an aside, the, the, many may have seen that Department of Public Health at the Massachusetts at the state level uh, just changed their masking advisory. There was no mask mandate in place uh, for the general public from the state level uh, this year, uh, but they've changed it from uh, advising those, uh, everyone, uh, regardless of vaccination status, uh, to be masked indoors. Uh, they changed that advisory to that if those people who are vaccinated, unless they're in a uh, situation where they're immunocompromised or live with someone who is or maybe elderly um, that for immunized uh, individuals it's not uh, a recommendation uh, for unvaccinated individuals it remains a recommendation that's the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, and then uh, finally the, the in October uh, as the Delta uh, wave was uh, becoming more pronounced uh, the Shrewsbury Board of Health that's our local Board of Health uh, here in town uh, instituted a mask mandate uh, at the recommendation of the Worcester Department of Public Health, which uh, works with Shrewsbury and other surrounding towns as part of the Central Mass Alliance for Public Health. Um, and that went into effect, and they, they had one broadly for the public, as well as uh, an executive order specifically uh, that, they, that they adopted specifically for schools, public and private, within the town of Shrewsbury. Um, that is the mandate that remains in effect in that the Shrewsbury Board of Health um, has determined they are not going to take any action on until uh, potentially at their next meeting on, on Friday morning, uh, February 4th. Um, so uh, what's really at play here? March. Uh, I'm sorry, March. I'm looking at the wrong calendar. Sorry. March 4th. Uh, so uh, in terms of what's at play here, and I think for the school committee to uh, deliberate uh, this evening, um, is that uh, it, uh, there's going to be the potential action uh, that the Shrewsbury Board of Health takes uh, on Friday, March 4th, um, of whether to uh, rescind that mandate. Uh, the school committee is meeting this evening. You have another regularly scheduled meeting uh, for Wednesday evening, uh, March 2nd. Uh, and uh, I know that the Board of Health indicated that part of their uh, rationale for not taking action on the school mask mandate to coincide uh, with what uh, is essentially uh, February 28th being when uh, schools are, are free of the state mandate, uh, is that uh, wanting to see data uh, from after the school vacation week, uh, given the level of uh, increase in cases that happened um, after the Thanksgiving break and after the December break. Um, and so that, uh, so regardless of anything that the, you as a school committee do, uh, a mask mandate will be in place in Shrewsbury Public Schools um, at least for those days when we return uh, on the 28th, the week after vacation. Uh, what uh, you, you may want to consider this evening um, is whether or not uh, you, uh, or when, whether and how uh, you would want to rescind the mask mandate that you have in effect, uh, whether you would want to do that in concurrently with when the Board of Health does, obviously 
regardless if you do rescind it, if you rescind it this evening, um, it, mass will still be in effect the week we return from break. Um, or if you want to wait uh, longer and uh, see whether or not uh, what things look like uh, next uh, the week after the break, uh, that's really what I think is up for discussion this evening. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over for you for your, your comments and questions. And uh, depending on where you think, I, I'd be happy to, to weigh in in terms of what I think might be a pathway forward. But I think it's important for you to discuss um, what, what you feel might be the best uh, approach uh, given this information. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Colleagues, uh, questions and comments regards to the mask mandate? Mr. Pallage. Sure. So thank you, Dr. Sawyer, for the update and, you know, a few comments on this issue, which is obviously weighing heavily on the minds of so many in the community. You know, where do I start? I, as a school committee member, everybody sitting around this bench, we have a responsibility to the safety of the students and staff in Shrewsbury Public Schools. That is our highest responsibility, and I know that everybody around this bench takes that very seriously. And so the question becomes, how do we make the decision to do what is in the interest of student safety? Uh, to me, that is thinking calmly and rationally about the information that's been presented to us, listening to the experts, and making a reasoned, measured decision. There's been a lot of public advocacy directed at this body of late, and I have to tell you that is a beautiful facet of democracy. I personally read every single email that we receive. I love when people email school committee. There are s stretches of months when nobody yeah. ever thinks to contact us because, frankly, nobody cares. <laughs> and it's depressing. And when we get a lot of emails, I, I pay attention to all of them. Yeah. But I have to say, regarding this discussion, um, there is this element to this public advocacy, almost like it's a game. Send a certain number of emails and you'll get the result you want. Use a few more exclamation points, make the tone a little more hostile. When I make a decision about the safety of our students and staff, I do not care how many likes or comments a Facebook post got. I am not interested in how many signatures are on the online petition or how many exclamation points are in the email. We have a responsibility to be calm, measured, reasonable about doing what's in the best interest of our kids and our staff. So what do I see as the situation before us? I think we are approaching that point where we need to give families and the community that light at the end of the tunnel. The requirements to mask, all of the requirements that have gone with the pandemic, they're stressful, they're depressing. They are getting in the way of the lives that we all want to lead. And I think we are approaching that time where we can not only give folks the option to unmask if they wish, while still supporting those who wish to do so, but move towards a life that isn't fully focused on the pandemic. I think I would like to see us give families that ray of light, that hope. The question to me is not do we, the question is when and how. And you know, obviously as Dr. Sawyer alluded to, uh, the Board of Health supersedes this body when it comes to a public health matter where it's in place until March the 4th. We do not get to decide to override the Board of Health in that regard. Uh, so what is the question before us? The state mandate on public schools will lift on February 28th, uh, though I do favor getting us away from masking in schools at some point this spring or the requirement to do so. I happen to think February 28th, which is the Monday of a return from school vacation, is a horrific day to do so. We have evidence that in 2021, the two school vacation weeks that have occurred so far, the week after in 2021 has correlated to a spike in cases. That wasn't necessarily the case the past year, but we all have to remember last year, there were a lot more restrictions still in place. Last year, it wasn't as easy to get on a plane or go somewhere. It's February vacation. What does that mean? People are getting on planes. They're going to hotels and resorts. They're going to restaurants. They're exposed to people they're not otherwise seeing. I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that the week after February vacation might not look like the week before. And so I happen to think that that particular week would not be a good moment for us to lift the restriction. Personally, I would favor the following Monday, which I believe, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I believe would be Monday, March 7th, yes. as a date for us to resume uh, letting students who wish to do so unmask, mm -hmm. while also supporting students who do and staff who do make the choice to continue to mask. I think that buffer would be an appropriate response that allows us to see if there is a spike or if anything happens in the week after vacation. And I think that would be uh, the, the way to do this that prioritizes safety based on what we have seen happen from two school vacation weeks thus far, while also giving families and staff that light at the end of the tunnel, making clear when does this end. The last comment that I'll make is 
I would also like to see us, and this would be a, a charge to the superintendent to recommend to this body, I would like to see us have a deliberative discussion about the future. Because someone could reasonably say and ask, you know, we, we, who could have predicted the pandemic? Who could have predicted the next wave? Who's to say there isn't another wave? Who's to say there's not another variant? I would like to see us have, in a calmer moment, a thoughtful discussion about what would bring pandemic response measures back? What would have to happen to trigger something like a return to masking or, or some sort of other requirement? We, in the past two years, have been in a very reactive mode, uh, as has everyone, uh, about needing to respond to situations as they develop. And I think that one charge that I would like to see this body undertake together with our staff is being clear with family, staff, and the community if something like this were to happen again, what would be the tripwire that would get us back to those requirements? Because during these conversations, a lot of very emotional, very political conversations can emerge and crowd out what should be strictly public health conversations. So those are my thoughts on the issue before us. Thank you. Comments, uh, Ms. Heffernan. Sure. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate your comments, Mr. Pallich, and I think I'm fair, fairly in, in line. I'll just give, give the my committee members my take on this. I completely agree that my goal in being here is to keep our kids and staff safe. Um, I am not a public health expert. I do not have a medical degree, as my, as, as my colleague does. Um, uh, I'm here as an elective representative, frankly, trying to do the best that I can with what, with what information has been presented to us at any given time that we make a decision. Um, we have made a lot of decisions about mitigation measures. Sometimes we've had to change those decisions because better information comes, comes before us. Um, I think our local decision in the fall on a mass mandate to, or to put that back in context came when the state wasn't giving us guidance um, um, and was leaving it to the, to the local level. Our local board of health hadn't made a decision to act. We had many in the community who were concerned about putting kids back in classrooms. Um, uh, we hadn't yet decided as a, as a committee to put a vaccine mandate in place for our own staff. Um, and so that decision at the time was I think the right decision for, for us to make. Um, I am absolutely thrilled that the numbers are going down. Um, and uh, I certainly am tired of this. We're all tired of, of this and the signs are that things are getting better. I feel confident um, in my understanding of um, our local board of health, and I want to be clear, our Shrewsbury board of health, and while they partner with the city of Worcester, it's our own officials making decisions for us for what's best for our community, that they are looking at the data. I was relieved to see that they were paying attention to when school vacation fell. Um, uh, as, as a parent and as someone who looks at the, the slides that we saw earlier, the, the rise in cases after uh, vacation, um, uh, consistently seem a bit alarming uh, and, and, and foretell that while things are better and certainly overarching community spread seems lower, um, it seems prudent to, to be uh, a little bit more cautious there. And so I'd appreciate that the Board of the Health said that what they wanted to do was look at the data. And frankly, they're better at looking at the data than I am. Um, and so we have all as um, community members in this pandemic tried to become many experts virologists or immunologists, and I am very happy that the board has, has decided that they, are, want, they want to look at those numbers as we come back from the school vacation week. Um, and so uh, while I, I, in many ways, I really feel like we're at a place where we can defer to them and their, and their guidance on this, um, and I'm frankly happy to defer to them. I think they're in a better position than we are, um, and I can respect that, uh, that, that they're meeting on March, 10th, or March 4th. Um, hopefully foretells a very positive step forward that many in this community want to see, want to see us moving towards. Um, and so whether they decide that it's March 4th or March 7th or March 9th or whatever it might be, um, I think we know it's coming and, um, and I could put a lot of faith in them. Um, and so that's probably the direction that I would like to see if I, if, if I, uh, my own opinion, uh, where I'd like to see us moving. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McGee. So I agree with my colleagues and I think the, the, points I want to highlight are that, first of all, we haven't been good at predicting what's going to be next with COVID at all for two years. And, and so 
to extend into the next two weeks or whatever and say we know the line is going to co uh, continue to go down is, is not based on our experience in the past. We have not been very good at predicting uh, things at all. We have thought we saw the light at the end of the tunnel more than once and have been proven to be wrong. So it's nice to have a steady state. And one, you know, one comment that uh, I've heard from Mr. Palish and Dr. Sawyer is, is the words calm and steady. <laughs> And I think that's what we need to provide for our students and for our school system is, is just a steady state. We are, we are different than other uh, organizations or anything else. People have wondered why the schools would be different from the rest of the town. And we have 20% of the population in the school in close quarters all day, five days a week. Uh, we're in a different position, and the metrics we are dealing with aren't just hospitalizations and deaths, it's absences and illnesses. And, and so if we're bumping up our absentee rate, if teachers aren't there to teach as, they, as we can see just within the past few weeks, then we've got a problem and we need to be able to address it. We are mandating masks because we feel that masks decrease the risk of acquiring or transmitting COVID. And when we decide to lift the mask mandate, we have to be in a position to say, whatever the prevalence is of COVID, we can tolerate it going up a little bit because uh, unless it's trending down to zero, uh, that is something we have to anticipate. And so we need a good, low, steady number to be able to comfortably do this without seeing a bump in illness and absentee rates. Um, the February break presents us with a very nice stress test. And if we can get to the other side of that and be in good shape, then I think that we'll, we will be able to do the right thing and, and lift the masks at that time. I also would like to point out the fact that people have been wearing masks for two years now. And, and this whole debate really boils down to maybe five days as to uh, when we lift the mask mandate. Uh, it is not a, a, a big debate here, and we have to keep this in proportion um, to what it really is. We're just looking for a little time to make an informed decision based on the fact that the numbers that are going down achieve some low steady state. So I, I agree with waiting for the Department of Public Health. I think that's a good idea. I also would like to take out the highlighter and go over what Mr. Palish said about us developing some metrics to follow so that we know what to track and to see are things getting worse should we think about bringing them back rather than <clears throat> waiting for a crisis and dealing with all the emotion. Calm and steady. Thank you very much, Ms. Ritz. Thank you. Um, I think these are, this is one of these issues, like you said, we're getting a lot of emails on and we don't always get emails. I think this is a very emotional time for families. Um, we have to be sure that we're listening to everyone's um, concerns, pros and cons. Everybody's voice is welcome on this. We also have to pay attention to the medical data. Um, for me, this is not a political decision. It's what's right for our district. How do we keep our schools open and safe? And that's been our number one goal for two years. Um, at this point, I feel um, that we have family, staff, and students are our main concern. Um, but we also have to give that same group some idea of where we're going to move on this process because we need to plan purposefully going forward uh, as far as I understand from the medical data COVID is never going away hundred percent we're gonna have to learn to live with it at some point so I'm fine with waiting for the um, data to come on March 28th as we go through that week after school vacation just to make sure that we're, we're our numbers are staying where they are they're still trending down and I would like for us to vote on March 1st, make a decision pending the outcome of the vote on Friday. So we vote, and then if it is a rescission, I agree with uh, Mr. Palich that I would like to have the masks, if it is a, a positive vote from the Board of Health, that masks be removed as of March 7th. But that gives us some time to make sure that our feet are where they should be. We're getting all the data that we need and that we also are giving a timeline to everyone involved in this because they deserve that as well. Thank you very much. Um, and just so the public knows, we did have about 25 to 30 emails about mixed uh, mixed responses. Uh, and I look back to the beginning of the school year and how this all started. And as was mentioned by my colleagues, the guidance provided by the Department of Education, I believe, was mask optional, which I think logistically would have had many challenges to execute, which is why this board had to vote on August 18th to put into place universal masking. It just made sense at the time. 
right? Uh, and from what I recall, the response in terms of public response was very little. It might have yielded one, maybe two emails tops, right? So uh, and we do know and we've talked about how the Shrewsbury Board of Health voted in October, which essentially their mandate trumps ours, right? So, um, and I've read all the emails. Um, you know, unfortunately, I have dipped it, uh, my toe into the uh, the social media realm as well. But I, I do want to keep my finger on the pulse of what's being said. Um, you know, if anybody thinks that this is is taken lightly or is an easy you know decision, you know, I think the last two years have shown the challenges that we've all faced as a community uh, to navigate through uncharted waters. Um, so I do agree with my colleagues. I. I I disagree uh, with the state's uh, decision on rescinding mask mandates in schools on the 28th. Uh, I don't understand how you make that decision when you look at the data, which is all I've been doing for the last two years, is following the data, making data-driven decisions. As Ms. Heffernan said, I, I, I feel the same way. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not an expert. I need the data. I need the guidance of certified medical professionals to make an informed decision. And what I see in terms of the day after a vacation over the last two breaks, if you go to Thanksgiving and the holiday break, was an 86% surge. To me, that's not a wise decision to rescind the day after uh, a vacation ends, right? So I, from my perspective, I was, I was pleased with the Board of Health's decision to defer until we see where the data takes us. And I agree with my colleagues uh, that we should align, um, you know, uh, with uh, their uh, guidance, and that's kind of where things are at. Um, so, just to get some perspective on, I know I said we, March first, and it's March, March 2nd. second is our yeah. next meeting, right? Sorry. So, it, I'm just curious from the perspective of of the members here, is is that kind of the approach we want to take in terms of our vote? Would that be something we want to do on the second? We want to do something tonight. I don't want to do anything tonight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm in agreement with that. So I think uh, it's important for us to, to take a vote on uh, March 2nd uh, in advance of the Board of Health's meeting on March 4th. Any further comments? Or I, would, I guess I would just say that I, I you know, I, I would have been comfortable taking a vote tonight, but to Mrs. Fritz's point, if, if the purpose is to see how the return from vacation works, we do have a meeting scheduled that week, and mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly appropriate to take action then. Uh, and again, as a reminder, we're under the auspices of the Board of Health's Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. mandate, which is in effect until the 4th anyway. Exactly. So we, we will meet two days prior to the expiration of that on the 2nd. So mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with that. Very good. I am, I am as well. For, this, for the same reasons, I would have been comfortable to vote on it tonight, but I'm happy to defer to the 2nd and see what our, what our data shows and um, make some decisions at that time. Okay, great. Thank you all very much you. for your comments. And uh, we will uh, resume the discussion and potential vote on March 2nd. At our next meeting. Okay, uh, moving on. Just oh, sorry. Yeah, just to, <laughs> thank you. And just so I want to make sure I have clarity what the, the committee needs from uh, me and our team. Uh, and, and I concur. I, I do think that people need to have some certainty. I'm, I'm encouraged by the trend. Uh, I concur with the uh, thinking it's prudent to see if we get um, a, a spike in cases after the break. Uh, and again, I think this is less about. Uh, you know, we're, we're been fortunate, and, and you know, it isn't it obviously it isn't without risk, and we want to be sensitive to folks who do have compromised situations that make it riskier for them. Um, that said, you know, fortunately, uh, we've had very little negative effect, uh, other other than some people. I mean, again, I, I, you know, no one's mentioned the issue. Of course, so some some people have communicated. Uh, that uh, so-called long COVID is a concern for some, and there's a percentage of, of people who get COVID who have those lingering symptoms in different ways, and that's a real concern as well. Uh, but in terms of where we're at, um, I, I, I agree with Dr. McGee. You know, we're trying to maintain stability in the educational, and that goes to the, the, the goal we've, we've talked about before, you know, keeping kids in school and, and making it a stable experience for them. Um, so, you know, we, it was a real scramble after, I, and I, I think it would be really unusual if we have a spike that big again. I was right in the middle of the Omicron surge, of course, but uh, just trying to get coverage for teachers and staff was, was a challenge, so that makes sense. Um, so if I understand it, you're looking for uh, on February, I'm sorry, on March Wednesday, 2nd. March 2nd, yep. um, you're looking for both uh, the data, uh, where we're at for cases, mm -hmm. uh, what that's looked like coming out of the vacation, 
um, and you're looking for a recommendation for uh, what potential uh, circumstances there might be that if the if you rescind your mandate uh, where we might consider uh, in conjunction with public health experts and medical experts uh, moving back if that necessity uh, came up in, in the future is there anything else you need from me correct Yes. oh Ms. Yeah. And just one piece that I do think is an is an important one not nothing to that particular point dr. Sawyer but just as I think about this um, I, I think I can speak for all of us, but certainly speak up if I have this wrong. None of us are suggesting that we should move toward a ban on masks in schools, and that will continue to be the flexibility for individuals to wear masks if they want to wear masks, whether they are um, staff or children. I would, Dr. Sawyer, love any thoughts that you and your leadership team might have about how we go about balancing that and recognizing that I am concerned about one of the first thing my children said to me is, well, well, even if your parent tells you to, my mom's never, you know, like kids won't do it if everyone else isn't doing it. And that we, that those are cultures of young people. And so um, that we need to figure out how we promote tolerance and respect in, an, in this moment in time where individuals have very different feelings and different life circumstances. And I think that is a, that is a challenge, but an obvious conversation that we need to as a community have as we are moving out of this pandemic, yet individuals have different circumstances. In particular, I think about and maybe our maybe your nursing nursing staff can help us. But as I understand, the CDC does still say that kids, when they're out, or staff are out for five days and they come back, they must wear masks for five more days. And so that creates some awkwardness. <laughs> if a student has been out of the building for a, few, for a number of days, and now we're sharing some medical information that historically teachers don't get to know and staff understand. So there there's a there's some diciness here, and I want to just acknowledge that. Um, as we continue to ask for some grace uh, amongst both parents and students as we try to kind of come to whatever our next new normal is. Um, but that's going to be an, an yet another challenge uh, for, your, for your staff, I think, Dr. Sawyer. Yeah, the, the, the point is, is important, and I, that's something we definitely can, can do and bring uh, some information on the second. I, I think that um, in, in both directions, both making sure that those uh, individuals, students, or staff who wish to continue to wear a mask um, are, are comfortable doing and supported in doing so. Um, and the flip side of that equation is that those, uh, if it is an optional uh, true choice, those who choose not to wear their masks should also uh, feel comfortable making that choice. Uh, so it's really on, on both sides of that that we'll need to make sure we're communicating very clearly. Um, but yes, thank you. We can certainly bring some more information about that as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, the next item on our agenda is under policy. Uh, it is a vote regarding the school district calendar for 2022-2023 school year. Uh, a draft of the calendar was presented to the school committee at the meeting on February 2nd uh, with a summary of changes provided by Dr. Sawyer. The draft calendar was posted on the district website for public comment. Shrewsbury Education Association and Shrewsbury Paraprofessionals Association officers were consulted. Um, and Dr. Sawyer took feedback uh, received into account, uh, determined that his recommendation for the calendar is unchanged uh, from the one that was presented on February 2nd. Um, I do know we did receive uh, emails, about 15 or so emails, um, with regards to Columbus Day uh, and Indigenous People Day. Um, but I'm um, not sure, Dr. Sure if any further comment from you? Sure, a couple quick things. Uh, first off, uh, I did want to note that uh, there have been times where we've indicated on the calendar uh, which of the professional development days uh, will be the, the day contractually that our paraprofessionals have a full professional development day. Um, I, I know that Ms. Christie's here this evening, uh, president of the Susan Power Professional Association. And uh, we've consulted with the SPA, but we have not had a chance to meet yet in person to talk about some suggestions they have about what the timing might be, as well as some other things associated with it. So um, in a future uh, calendar, we might signal which one it is, uh, but that, that's really not uh, germane to, to the students and families. You know, it's, it's important to know that the days that are actually there would not be changing as a result of that. Um, in terms of the uh, issue relative to uh, Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I did give consideration. I mentioned at the last meeting I would bring a recommendation to you. Um, and I, I want to uh, just uh, clarify that you know, my perspective here uh, is that 
Uh, we maintain the practice uh, of listing both on the calendar. Uh, the re rationale I have for that is that uh, this listing uh, of the name of a holiday on a calendar, um, in terms of the name of the holiday itself, uh, that's outside of the control of the school committee or the school department. Um, and I don't believe uh, that that uh, is coupled with uh, what I think is very important, uh, which is uh, you know, how it is that we teach about different holidays or their origins or elements of, of history. Um, the, the calendar uh, listing holidays does not endorse a particular holiday or the origin of the name of that holiday. Uh, and I, I certainly understand that there are those uh, who petition the school committee that see that differently uh, regarding uh, that as a symbolic action. Uh, but uh, again, I don't believe it's coupled with what we do in the classroom, um, which of course we should do with great accuracy and great care. Um, so that is the recommendation. If you other pieces in the memo, if people have questions about it, I'm happy to answer. But uh, uh, otherwise, it just it, it stands as recommended uh, from your previous meeting. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Comments, questions, Ms. Hebernett? Yeah, I want to appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness, Dr. Sawyer, and the, in, in the recommendation here. Um, Ensuring that our schools are places where everyone feels like they belong is centrally important to me. Um, and I was very happy to serve on the town-wide DEI task force. Um, uh, that, that said, um, I think what we teach in our, in our buildings is not connected to what we put on a label on a, on a calendar. Um, and so I know that progress has been made in terms of talking about um, and attempts have been made since Frankly, last, the last time we had an, an issue of any similarity was around the mascot last June, where we made a vote to make sure to say, to ask that the leadership team really think about how we talk about indigenous cultures. Um, and I believe that work, there's, I'm sure more to do, is, is progressing. And so at this point in time, I think it's um, the right thing to do to, to keep the calendar as we, as we have in the past and really be focusing on what matters, which is what happens in classrooms. Further comments and questions, Ms. Fritz? Um, thank you, Lindsay. I, I agree with your comments. I think we were asked to look at this last year. We had another um, email or letter come to us and ask us to um, please reconsider removing Columbus Day and just keeping Indigenous Peoples Day on the calendar. Um, and as a school committee member, my major concern is how do we teach history? And it's not a political decision. It's what do we do in our schools? How do we teach it? And I personally believe that um, exploration and education in relation to historical figures and any identified group should be inclusive. It should be holistic. We should be looking at them for great achievements as, well as their worst mistakes. Um, our district should remain committed to teaching history in an inclusive and accurate manner and not exclude any person or groups. And part of uh, DEI um, discussions now is diversity of thought, which is a global perspective and valuing differences. And I think what we want to do as a school is make sure that we're teaching all sides of every historical issue. So I personally um, want to keep both Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day on the calendar. And again, my main concern is not the political side of this argument that we're seeing in the media quite a bit, but how do we teach it and what facts do we provide to students that are inclusive of all persons, groups, and events so that they are all well-educated and can make their own decisions. Okay, thank you very much for the comments, questions. Mr. Pouch. I appreciate the comments of my colleagues. This is an issue where, to be blunt, my own personal opinion has evolved over the past few years. I had started um, sort of being a bit taken aback that some of this advocacy was being directed at a school committee, seeing us as not an entity that names state holidays. And in recent years, um, have listened a lot and come to understand the impact that symbolism can have uh, and what things are called and what things are named. Um, we've received a lot of emails on this topic, including lately uh, a lot of emails referencing Italian heritage. And for those who, who may not know, and this is not the type of thing that I frequently find myself saying at a school committee meeting, but Italian is part of my heritage. Um, having said that, I have reached the conclusion on a personal level that Christopher Columbus is not somebody that I feel should be revered. Uh, and I do think that this is some an area where I, perhaps on a personal level, don't agree with the recommendation before us. Uh, it is clear to me that that is not the prevailing opinion here tonight. And it's also important for us to recognize that there's other business being handled by the passage of the school calendar, including the setting of important dates that are relevant to staff, students, and families. Uh, so while my personal opinion differs from the recommendation here, I will not withhold my vote for the calendar for that reason. Okay, for the comments. Um, yeah, I, I 
agree with my colleagues. Certainly, um, yeah, I think we took an inclusive approach last year uh, for this year's school calendar uh, by acknowledging Indigenous People Day along with Columbus Day. Um, you know, I do appreciate uh, the questions that Dr. Sawyer posed uh, to us, and I, I do think it's definitely something we, you know that we should should have discussed. Uh, and I, I do respect the perspectives of those residents that that submitted the petition. Um, I think, from my perspective, uh, you know, while I recognize uh, you know this is a holiday on the school calendar that we're talking about, I don't believe that this is something for us to decide. It's it is a state holiday. Uh, it is the reason why the legal reason why. Uh, there is no school on that date, and, and as my colleagues have said, I don't believe this changes the approach uh, to how things are taught uh, within our curriculum. Um, so I uh, would also uh, agree to no no change to um, to the school calendar. Uh, so with that, um, I need a motion that the school committee vote to approve the proposed 2022-2023 school year calendar. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please do so by saying aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is under finance and operations. It is the FY23 superintendent's budget recommendation. Dr. Sawyer and Mr. Collins will present the superintendent's initial recommendation for the fiscal year 2023 school department budget. Um, the, uh, the fiscal year 2023 superintendent's initial budget recommendation document uh, was provided under separate cover. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Sawyer and Mr. Collins. Thank you very much, Mr. Winsky. Um, and this is indeed a good news story uh, for sure. Uh, very pleased that uh, we're able to bring a budget to you uh, that is going to meet the needs of the school district, uh, not risk any sort of reductions or cuts. Um, as a result of not having enough funding. Um, it actually allows us, based on the evolution of how our costs and our needs will actually be able to uh, add and then make some new investments uh, that will help us in some critical ways. Uh, if uh, we'll cover this evening, uh, you know, the, the kind of framework we have in terms of the override agreement, our limitations to the budget as a result, uh, some cost projection for different major programs or major categories of programs, uh, our enrollment projections, which of course are something that we take into great consideration when we're thinking about funding for next year, um, how managing through the COVID pandemic has affected us and what funding we've had to be able to do that. Um, and then finally, the recommended new investments. Um, as far as an overview, this is uh, again, very different than past years. Uh, typically, I would make a recommendation based on the needs of the school district. Uh, as I saw them based on feedback from the leadership team and, and uh, what we see as, as uh, you know, needs in the coming, coming year. Uh, the town manager would file a budget based on a balanced budget for the town based on the amount of resources available and there would be a gap between those two numbers. Uh, sometimes an extremely substantial gap uh, that would only be closed by uh, potentially the town manager's estimate getting better over time and then also us reducing costs, either reducing what we would like to add uh, or in you know, too many years actually cutting personnel or programs uh, from uh, the school district. Uh, what you see on this slide is that this year uh, we have uh, no gap. Uh, the gap is zero. Uh, and that is because of the existing uh, agreement that the school committee and the board of selectmen have uh, that the override was predicated on, uh, where there would be a very specific amount of funding available um, to the school department uh, based on the revenue that was taken in uh, this year under, under the override uh, and any other sources. Um, and so you can see that the uh, difference between our current fiscal year of 2022 and what the uh, recommendation is for 2023 is at a 4.75% uh, increase in the budget. Um, that is the uh, amount that it is capped at. Um, you know, the, the amount is four and a quarter up to a range of four and a quarter to 4.75. Um, you can see on this next slide that the, uh, you know, the agreement does call for the four and a quarter, but if there's sufficient additional revenue and there was uh, for the town this coming year, uh, Mr. Mizikar just filed that uh, in his fiscal projection one. Um, and then overall, this agreement that we are in, it, it's uh, designed to cover at minimum, at least four fiscal years, the current year, next year, and then fiscal year 24 and 25. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how the resources are allocated across the budget and uh, uh, some other specifics relative to uh, 
where the money is is uh, targeted. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So uh, this is a broad-based view of the uh, $79.3 million uh, operating budget or so-called town appropriation. Um, and you can see where the uh, largest share of the investment uh, goes uh, and is budgeted for fiscal 23, and that's 84% uh, towards uh, all of the salaries and wages for all of our staff. Um, $66.2 million uh, of the total, 79.3. Um, you can see other, uh, the next kind of like largest areas uh, go into school transportation at 3.1 million or 4%. Um, special ed uh, transportation, just over a million dollars. Uh, special education tuitions, just under 3.5 million. And that's net of circuit breaker reimbursement, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Uh, our students who attend vocational high schools, about 1.6 million. Uh, contractual services, which would be things that we contract out for, uh, like legal services, uh, some special education, specialized services, uh, repairs and maintenance of equipment, uh, translation services, advertising. Those are just some examples of uh, contractual services. Um, and we got about $1.4 million going into educational supplies and equipment uh, and textbooks. Um, and then finally, the, the last category, 1% or about $900,000 going into kind of this catch-all, all, all other expenses, which would be, for example, uh, cost for postage, custodial supplies, copier supplies, telephone expenses, things like that. So that's kind of the major areas of investment of uh, the $79.3 million. This next pie chart takes just the salaries and wages piece of that pie, and uh, because it's the largest investment, just provides a little bit more explanation about uh, where uh, that money goes. So, uh, again, the largest share would be uh, with our teaching uh, staff, teachers, nurses, uh, psychologists, um, that all part of a collective bargaining unit, so-called Unit A. Uh, that's about 74% uh, or $48.7 million dollars. Um, Kind of just going uh, clockwise or, uh, would be paraprofessional staff at $8.1 million or 12% uh, is the next next largest piece of the pie. And then uh, secretarial and, and other support staff like uh, IT support staff, just over $3 million. Day-to-day uh, -day substitute teachers, which we were referenced earlier uh, as a result of uh, staff illnesses. Uh, and long-term substitutes, uh, $900,000 or 1.4% 1 of uh, this total piece of pie. Um, other wages would include uh, stipends or uh, curriculum work that occurs during uh, the summertime and summer special education program staffing. Uh, and then tuition and other reimbursement would be uh, special compensation uh, categories like uh, sick leave, sell back for retirees or tuition reimbursement programs. And then finally, uh, district administration, which would be central office, principals, assistant principals, um, at 6% or uh, $3.9 uh, million. This takes the, the overall uh, next year budget uh, of the $79.3 million into just basic four large categories. Um, salaries and wages, transportation services, out-of-district tuitions, and then supplies and materials. Again, it's kind of a 30,000-foot level look. Um, and uh, then uh, you can see right below there this new investments in, in orange. Uh, uh, it proposed at $878,000, which Dr. Sawyer plans to uh, spend quite a bit of time this evening explain, explaining and, and laying out his recommendation for that. Um, one thing I would like to point out here is uh, this you know, categories of uh, transportation services and out-of-district tuitions, which are actually budgeted to go down next fiscal year by about $1.2 million. This is, this is an anomaly. This is uh, not something that we usually experience. Um, and this is what, in fact, affords Dr. Sawyer for next year to make some recommendations for some new investments. So, um, certainly the stability of the override, uh, the 4.75% the, uh, increase uh, provides uh, sufficient resources to move forward. Um, but it's not as if like every year I would not expect 
uh, looking forward to fiscal 24 and 25 that we might have this same level of monies available for new investments because I don't expect transportation services or out of district tuition to go down again. So it's, 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 pervading, it's creating some space, if you will, an opportunity uh, for the upcoming year, which is great. In terms of uh, where we are with our uh, labor negotiations, uh, you can see here that we are in negotiations right now with the unit A, which is the largest unit, uh, about 525 uh, people. Um, and also uh, unit B, which is the assistant principals and athletic director that includes about uh, 11 people in that group. Um, and unit D, uh, in terms of uh, for next fiscal year, uh, that contract is settled, as folks know, uh, recently. And that provides for next uh, fiscal year uh, a 2.25% increase on their wage scale uh, and uh, also includes uh, new steps, uh, higher steps for both the NC3 category and NC6A, which is uh, kind of the codes used for uh, classroom and special education paraprofessionals, <coughs> excuse me, and ABA technicians, which is the two largest shares of that group of about 275 uh, folks. Uh, so that's a known entity going into fiscal 23. Uh, this is just a bit of a drill down on uh, the second of the four largest categories, transportation, and the types of services that we provide, and uh, a year-to-year -year budget comparison. Uh, of course, fiscal 22, we're still in the midst of this year, so these are budget-to-budget -budget comparisons. Um, we are fiscal 23, we'll be going into the fifth year of a five-year contract with our uh, contractor A Transportation. Um, calls for a 2.9% uh, increase on the rate. Um, but we also provide other services uh, beyond just home to school, regular day transportation like homeless, uh, McKinney Vento is also known as homeless transportation services, uh, transportation services for, for children in foster care. Those have high variability uh, from year to year, uh, but uh, we've got some uh, increase uh, uh, that we're, we're thinking is prudent for the homeless transportation. Vocational transportation right now, um, you know, we, we information that we, we we're running three buses right now to Aspen Valley High School. Um, we know that the admissions policy statewide has changed. Uh, we do have some students who have applied to uh, uh, other vocational high schools, uh, if they are accepted and decide to go, we would have to provide transportation to them. Uh, so there's some variability in that particular category that's going to kind of play out as the admissions process for those students plays out between now and April. Um, athletic uh, transportation for the high school, and then um, people transportation services for special education uh, services. This is, again, an area where we're able to budget a decrease, um, and it's, it's primarily a function of uh, decreased uh, population of out-of-district placement students, which you'll see in an upcoming slide, um, and uh, being able to uh, right-size, if you will, our operating budget for providing out-of-district uh, services uh, primarily is the reason for that going down. Bus monitoring services is uh, uh, expected to go up, and we're we place bus monitors really only on buses where there is a child who uh, requires a bus monitor based upon an individual educational plan. So we do not provide bus monitors on all of our buses. It's really uh, not necessary. You can see it's a, it's a pretty expensive line item to uh, have bus monitoring uh, services just on the buses that we do, which is right now about, uh, I'd say it's about 11 buses right now. Um, and we're trending a little bit over budget uh, in the current year, so I've uh, adjusted that for the upcoming fiscal 23 in terms of the budget. Uh, out of district uh, <coughs> special education tuitions, um, fiscal 23, again, this is the year where uh, we're based upon the current information that we have, uh, we can uh, budget uh, less for uh, next year. Uh, our total tuitions uh, and working with uh, Mrs. Belsito and Mrs. Bartlett uh, on a regular basis to review students who are uh, either placed currently um, or uh, kind of in a, uh, a potential category, if you will, of an outplacement. And we'll look at that again 
as this budget process develops between now and April and make sure we have the most current information. Um, but right now we have a, a total budget of tuitions of just about $6.4 million and we're planning for uh, using circuit breaker reimbursement of about $3 million. And so the resulting amount, $3.4 million, is what we need to put in our operating budget. So it's funded by two different sources. Um, vocational Technical High School, again, I mentioned the change in admissions policy. Uh, so we're expecting uh, that en en enrollment uh, decrease for fiscal 23. Uh, $471,000 decrease. Uh, you'll see some more stats upcoming on uh, enrollment for that. Uh, and then materials and equipment. Um, we've had uh, a, a, a number of accounts where uh, we allocate funding to schools based upon a per capita basis, if you will. We've used that formula for a number of years, so-called site-based funds. And uh, going back uh, to fiscal 16, some of those accounts for supplies uh, and, and other more discretionary expenses that principals can make have not changed since fiscal 16. Um, so in those cases, uh, I've adjusted those budgets based upon uh, having level funding for that many years and uh, knowing how prices are going right now in the marketplace. Some of those have been increased by about 7.5%. Um, for the upcoming year. Um, and then we just look, basically look at each individual account and see based upon histor historical trend, if we can keep it level funded, we will. If we can decrease, we will. At this point, I'll turn it back to Dr. Sawyer and we'll talk about some enrollment. Um, so the, we did our enrollment projections earlier this year and shared that report with you. We're projecting a little over 5,800 students uh, next year. It's down a little bit from our high a few years ago. Uh, it's still very difficult to predict what's happening with early childhood. There's been a lot of changes because of the pandemic, and we'll monitor that closely um, as a result. Uh, this next slide, you can see that the, uh, as Mr. Collins referenced, our vocational technical population we think will go down because of the change in uh, admissions policies at the state level, uh, projecting 84 students at this point uh, for next year. That's what's factored into the budget. Uh, in terms of out-of-district special ed, again, just referred to that. We see that number uh, moving downwards, uh, which will uh, is resulting uh, less money needing to be set in that category for next year. Uh, this is uh, difficult to see on the screen, I know, but uh, if you uh, have the slide deck or you look at it tomorrow, uh, these are the projected class sizes. This is a really good news story as a result of having enough teachers and enough space at the elementary level. Um, I think in every instance across that grid, uh, every single class size is within school committee guidelines, um, and in most cases on the lower end, or maybe even a little below the lower end. Um, so it's really a, a strong situation for us to be in, and given coming out of COVID, that's a really good place to be. I, I would be very concerned if we were stressing class sizes, and we're trying to do the work that we're doing now, uh, with, uh, given the needs we're seeing with students. Uh, the next piece is uh, secondary schools. Um, again, this is more of a function of space than anything else. Uh, we're, uh, the good news is we're within class sizes and in, in, uh, projected for three of the four middle school grades. Um, at Oak, both are projected to be 24, which is the upper range of the 22 to 24 recommended class size. Um, at Sherwood, a little below it on the lower end in grade five, but predicted to be one above the guideline in grade six. Um, but uh, you know, we, we do are, are a bit stressed for space uh, there, and uh, that's something that is uh, um, you know, better than some of the class size we've had in recent years still. Uh, so that part is, is good. And we'd like to see it get better over time there, if possible. Um, in the high school, it you know, really varies by course and grade level. We don't display that on this, uh, on this chart. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, again, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins to talk a little bit about some of the sources of funds we've been able to use for dealing with the pandemic. So just to uh, be clear that, um, you know, the operating budget that's uh, recommended to you this evening to bring to the annual town meeting really has no dedicated financial resources for managing three, through COVID. What we have done is, like uh, all other school districts, is received uh, federal and state funding to help us manage through COVID and all of its impacts. 
Um, to date, uh, we've been awarded uh, just over uh, $4.1 million in federal and state grants uh, to deal with the pandemic. Um, and so our plan is to, for fiscal 23, uh, continue to rely on um, primarily two sources of funds, the, uh, the uh, so-called ESSER two and ESSER three funding, um, which is still available and have some more information on that. Uh, all of this $4.1 million was basically allo allocated across the nation and across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, primarily on a, a student headcount basis, size of district, as you would imagine, and also socioeconomic measures. So uh, districts with higher poverty levels received higher amounts of funding per capita than uh, wealthier districts. Um, and the $4.1 million, I basically just kind of broke into three categories to kind of show which ones have been already expended because we've expended a, a fair sum of these funds already. So these uh, first five grants have been already fully uh, expended, $1.7 million for things like PPE. Uh, there was dedicated funding for food service operations, uh, COVID testing, um, this co coronavirus relief fund grant, $1.7 Three nine million dollars, um, you know, provided resources for school reopening. Uh, in fact, in this room, um, Monday and Tuesday of this week was the uh, the town's auditor, uh, and they uh, specifically were auditing uh, the coronavirus relief fund this year, one point three million, three nine million dollars, and performing a series of test uh, sample testing for uh, all of those expenses. Uh, so these, uh, you know, obviously external auditors uh, as required are paying a particular attention to uh, uh, uses of COVID funds and making sure everything is done appropriately. And we had absolutely no problems whatsoever. Um, this next grouping of uh, um, COVID grants, uh, the uh, ESSER is the... Uh, Elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. Uh, these are federal funds. Uh, we've partially expended uh, these uh, funds, uh, but we have uh, 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 nearly all of the ESSER three funds uh, uh, almost uh, available still to us up through September of 24. Um, and uh, those are dedicated, as you know, from a prior report to support summer school and academic recovery programs um, uh, and alike for the coming summer uh, and last summer as well. Uh, so these funds are partially expended. And then the ones that uh, we have uh, plans for and basically you know, encumbered these funds on paper are, are really directed towards special education targeted uh, programs. Uh, so this first one, the largest, $389,000, the uh, American Rescue Plan Special Education Grant, that will be uh, seed money to start up the 18 to 22-year-old transitions program, special education transitions program, which Mrs. Belsita will talk more about in a more detailed report to you at an upcoming meeting uh, around special education and pupil personnel services budget for fiscal 23. And at this point, uh, we'll shift gears to uh, the new investments, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Sawyer. Thank you very much. Uh, so you know, the, the new investments that I'll uh, discuss in a moment are really focused on three broad areas. First, addressing some increased need uh, for mandated services for special education students and English language learner uh, education services. Uh, secondly, uh, a very significant investment <clears throat> excuse me, in addressing student uh, mental health crisis among students and providing proactive support for students' mental and behavioral, social, emotional well-being um, and restoring uh, a couple places where we've made cuts in the past or where there's some uh, barriers to potential participation for students. Uh, this next slide shows you for special education. Uh, we, there are three additions I'm recommending. Uh, one is to, or, or three categories, one is to uh, restore uh, a preschool teacher and a preschool aide that were previously cut in a previous year, um, and that would uh, allow us to meet the needs of the number of students who will be coming to us next year. Uh, secondly, is adding an, a, another special education teacher at Shrewsbury High School to address caseloads. And third, adding a uh, fraction, uh, four tenths, uh, full time equivalent position of speech and language pathologist at the elementary level to again uh, help us work through 
uh, demands around caseloads. Um, in terms of English language learning, you know, we, we are continuing to enroll a high number of English language learners. This position would be based on our projections shared between uh, Coolidge and Beal, uh, but adding a teacher uh, to that department uh, in order to have reasonable uh, caseload sizes uh, and meet those students' needs is important. Uh, next, we're talking about uh, providing a larger number of specialized personnel around mental and behavioral health and social and emotional well-being. Uh, first would be to add two additional adjustment counselors at the high school in order to address student needs and increase caseloads. Uh, similarly, adding an adjustment counselor at the middle school level. Um, it is certainly the upper grades, and uh, Ms. Belcito just got me some data uh, today about uh, where we are at now with hospitalizations, partial hospitalizations, recommendations for emergency mental health services, and so forth. Um, and it's clearly most intense at, at grades 7 through 12. Um, in, in terms of the middle level, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how we would deploy that position, but uh, clearly it's the middle and the high school level where we have the greatest need there. Um, also recommending adding two additional what we call clinical coordinators. Uh, these are board-certified behavior analysts who work uh, with uh, our teacher teams uh, around students who are having particularly difficult behavioral challenges. Um, with, if gone unaddressed, uh, can be very disruptive to the learning environment. And obviously it's important for that student's own learning to be able to uh, behave uh, within expectations within uh, the classroom and, and school setting. Um, and this is something that we've been, uh, that we have two currently in the district. They are very stretched. Uh, matter of fact, I had a, a conversation with the principal today about a very difficult student situation. Uh, and through no fault of, of anyone's other than the fact that they, their positions are too stretched, um, just haven't been able to get the consultation that they need to, to build a plan for that student. So um, it's an area we've been looking at for a few years of hopefully to make some additional investments and would like to do that at this time for next year. Uh, the next slide indicates uh, a new position recommending um, to add a director uh, position that would be within the uh, Student Services Department uh, titled Director of Clinical Counseling and Mental Health Services. Um, as we have been able to add over the last several years more adjustment counselors, uh, we've always had a cadre of school psychologists, um, the clinical coordinators I just mentioned. Uh, having someone who can be their uh, uh, leader of their department, uh, you know, we have a couple of lead folks right now who do some work to help make sure that their professional development or their staff meetings are appropriate when they have department meetings. Uh, but we, we just need a greater level of, of support and with someone who has that expertise. Because uh, right now that's stretching our other leaders in the special ed and student services department. Um, this would also be an individual with, who, with expertise who can be the primary contact with a variety of outside mental health providers with whom we work. Um, and that's something we think would be of great benefit to our program. Um, especially how, you know, reinforcing and strengthening the, the uh, model we have uh, in, in that area. Um, and then secondly on this slide, providing a social worker. Um, as I think was mentioned uh, earlier uh, in one of the comments, uh, I think it was Mr. Palich just talking about uh, sometimes there are outside influences that result in real challenges for kids within the school setting. Um, and while part of our job is to interact with families, uh, Having someone whose uh, expertise is around helping families with uh, issues that are occurring outside of the school or barriers. Um, and there are a number of situations where we're, we are connecting and interfacing with outside social services agencies, whether that's the Department of Children and Families, other uh, groups, uh, you know, to have someone with that expertise to be able to do that uh, would also be very beneficial in supporting our students and families and ultimately helping them be more successful in school. On this next slide, there's uh, two positions that are focused on uh, social emotional well-being in particular. Uh, one would be to add an instructional coach position at the elementary level. We're making some good progress uh, around implementing uh, our strategic priorities around well-being, student well-being, and social emotional learning. Uh, but uh, we need more capacity around providing training for staff, uh, coordinating best practices, integrating how those supports work throughout the elementary program. Um, and that's something that we think would be very beneficial to move that strategic priority forward um, and support it. And then uh, the mindfulness director position that we have uh, been funding through either grants or donations, uh, we're suggesting to move that um, to the appropriated budget for next year. 
Um, both of these uh, positions will provide some additional information to the committee uh, between now and when you'll be asked to vote uh, on a, a budget later in the spring. Um, in terms of doing some restoration of previous cuts, uh, recommending that we restore two uh, what we call allied arts uh, teaching positions at the middle level. Allied arts are the 30-day rotation students go through, whether that's, that's art or music or uh, at the uh, innovation lab. Uh, there's a variety of experiences kids receive, physical education, et cetera. Uh, we've cut that back over the last few years. Uh, not all students get all experiences as a result. Um, this also would provide additional flexibility within the middle school schedule that could um, assist us with, with providing the kind of middle school program that we had been providing uh, a few years ago before we experienced some of those cuts. Um, depending on what seems to make the most sense, we're not sure exactly which subjects those would be dedicated to. That's something the middle school team will be working on. And then finally, uh, this idea of reducing students' barriers to access programming. Uh, we heard a little bit about this when we surveyed the families and, and staff in the fall around one of the ESSER grants. Uh, but uh, you know, certainly we know that over time, Shrewsbury has become a high fee district uh, and uh, uh, feeling that uh, sometimes the activity fee that's at play uh, gets in the way of students maybe participating in things. And I think now more than ever, we want to find ways to connect kids to their school uh, in ways that are, are meaningful for them. Um, whether that's uh, being in the school musical or play, being part of a club after school. Um, the, these fees right now are 110 a year at the high school, 75 at the middle school, and 55 at Sherwood. Um, that one fee would cover as many clubs or academic teams or things of that nature, or the like, speech and debate, robotics, all those things come under this, this uh, activities fee. Um, and by reducing it, uh, uh, or eliminating this particular fee, we think it'll be more access for students and provide some relief uh, from the fee burden uh, for families. Um, so on the next slide, which is, uh, that's just an overall table summarizing it all. If you're looking at the, the slide deck, uh, uh, so you can see what that amounts to. Um, it does amount to uh, a little under $1.2 million. Um, and if you go to the, uh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so I mean a little bit under 1.2 uh, million. Um, right now the projection is that we have about $878,000 to work with. So we would not be able to fund under the current scenario all of those things, it would be about $300,000 over. Um, my hope is that over the course of the next uh, several weeks and, and months between now and when we'll ask you um, to uh, uh, vote on a budget to bring forward a town meeting, uh, that some of our cost projections are going to mature and we may have a little more room for these pieces. Um, otherwise, uh, we will be uh, need to make some decisions and I'll, I would have an updated recommendation for you when the time comes to vote as to what to include. Uh, but based on all the different things that were presented to us by the district leadership team, um, ultimately, these seem to be the areas that I felt uh, uh, were most uh, important uh, to try to provide some funding for uh, in the next uh, budget cycle. Um, and obviously be happy to take any questions about that. Um, so in summary, uh, we have uh, budget stability and predictability. Um, thanks to the override, which would greatly, greatly appreciate uh, what the uh, community has done to provide more resources for us. Um, we have to address the impacts of the pandemic, um, and mainly and, and particularly the student health, mental health crisis. Uh, we want to continue to maintain these desirable class sizes, which are key, and then uh, want to be able to strengthen our capacity to achieve uh, our vision and our goals as illustrated by the Portrait of a Graduate, our strategic priorities, um, and the new investments uh, do reflect uh, those in, in various ways. Um, so in terms of the timeline, um, we're, today we're uh, 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 making the recommendation. Uh, we may have something additional on March 2nd, but we will have uh, curriculum instruction and technology present to you on the 16th. Uh, we'll talk about fees then as well. Uh, for next year. Uh, there's a finance committee meeting on the 26th. Uh, we'll talk about special education and pupil personnel services, and there'll be a public budget hearing on March 30th. On April 13th, uh, you'll receive the final recommendation. We'll ask you to vote um, that uh, what will be presented to town meeting, which will happen sometime in May. Um, and so thank you uh, for listening. Uh, this is a lot of information, uh, but again, the simple message is that this is a really good news story, and. Uh, um, at a really important time to be able to provide some additional supports. Um, we will have the resources to do that. 
Um, so with that, if you have any questions, Mr. Collins or myself, happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Mr. Collins, uh, colleagues, questions, comments, Mr. Fritz? Just a couple of comments and um, one question. I do think it's a really different year for us. I never remember us having this type of a budget. Um, but again, we have to be mindful of the fiscal realities. It's not an unlimited pool of money. Um, I really like when uh, Dr. Sawyer makes the recommendation. It's inclusive of what uh, management and staff also sees as priorities in the district and that's helpful for us. I'm very um, grateful that we're looking at mental health issues and putting more resources and professional resources in that area so we can become proactive instead of reactive, which we've had to do for many years. And I think that will help all students as we go forward. Um, I do wanna thank again, the uh, public, this override um, was huge. The board of selectmen and the town and the um, town manager who also work closely with us till this day just to mention we still have two two meetings which are once a month we meet with the town manager and uh, two of the board of selectmen john myself dr sawyer mr collins and it's a very transparent and open process as we move through this which has been i think very helpful to me as we look forward to this new um budgeting that we're in um, one question I do have on, and I know this is just a real macro level, we're just starting this. When I look at the numbers that are in the estimated costs, um, like the, the mindfulness director is 75,000, is that the cost of the position or is that the cost to the um, budget because some of it was grant? How, how, and again, sure. that's just really high level. I know we're not getting into. I yep. Just so we're, we're actually into the third year now of this arrangement with uh, the Mindfulness Director uh, Initiative, which is a, a private uh, entity. And we have a contract. We've had a contract with them. So this is uh, outsourced, if you will. That's mm -hmm. not does not uh, in, involve a district employee. Um, the first two years of that contract, uh, they provided... Uh, close to uh, a full-time employee uh, to provide uh, services to the district. And um, the, the cost for that was about seventy dollars to $75,000 to them. We, our contract, uh, uh, we paid them $7,500. So we paid about 10% of the cost for year one, we paid about 10% of the cost for year two. We're in year three right now, and the contract uh, payment is $19,000. All of that funding came, uh, has come out of the Colonial Fund, mm -hmm. uh, not the operating budget. Uh, but over the course of three years, you know, for a value of about $225,000, we've you know, paid about $34,000. So um, the proposal that uh, is made uh, to you at this particular point from Dr. Sawyer is to um, reflect the, the real cost of that arrangement and put it into the operating budget to uh, have that um, continue on. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other comments? Mr. Pouch. Just to echo Dr. Sawyer and Mrs. Fritz's remarks, thanking the community for the operational override that enabled us to be having a conversation about additional investments in the district. I'm thinking of where we were one year ago when that effort was in its infancy and it was mm -hmm. far from a guarantee. Um, so I want to thank everyone who, who made this moment a reality where we're finally sitting here having conversation about increased investment mm -hmm. uh, in our students in a way that we have not been able to have during uh, my time on this committee or any of my colleagues time on this committee uh, of the new investments I want to particularly single out for praise uh, to the superintendent and his team the focus on student mental health mm -hmm. which we know is an issue that uh, has has certainly asserted itself front and center uh, was an increasing issue prior to the pandemic the pandemic has exacerbated the situation and we have no reason to think it's going to go away when the pandemic goes away um, so I, I just want to single out for praise the fact that the additional investments we're making in our students do focus on supporting their mental and emotional health. And I'm curious to receive public feedback mm -hmm. uh, on these uh, additional investments before the budget process is finalized later in the spring. Further comments, Ms. Heffernan? Yeah, uh, it's more of an, an add-on and sort of a somewhat of a, of a different lane, but I appreciate all of my colleagues. Um, I really appreciate our attempt for the first time it was, must be a very long time that there is a fee that we are looking to eliminate um, that uh, um, while as a total amount of all of the expenditures it's it is um, you know certainly less than less than 10 percent um, I agree that if there's a fee that's keeping a kid from being in a robotics program or a chess club or anything of after school nature um, now is a, now is a, as good a time as any to make sure that kids can, can get connected so I'm excited to see 
uh, that on the on the table, and I certainly hope it's something that through the course of this process we can accomplish. Uh, Dr. Two uh, two things here. One is we the mindfulness program and the mindfulness director uh, started as a pilot. It was externally funded, and we are moving it to mainstream. And I have to say uh, that. I don't know very much about this program. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what its results are. And I would like to, I know that they're going to present a report later, and I just would like to highlight the importance of uh, getting a real good sense as to what it looks like, how it's doing, how well it's been implemented, and uh, some means of us measuring uh, the value we're getting from it. So that's point one. Uh, point two is my concern regarding vocational training. And you know, we have uh, lost our ability to, to send a significant number of students to, to Asabet, and this is a loss for our population. It is a decrease in the, in the offerings uh, that would be very important for um, a few dozen students each year. And um, I just uh, feel very bad that we are doing it. Uh, we're, in some ways realizing a benefit from it uh, in that we have uh, lower tuitions and transportation costs as a result, but I think that some students will suffer. Mm -hmm. And I uh, would like to know, <coughs> excuse me, what possibilities there are for us mitigating this immediately, because I guess, you know, we, it's been taken away immediately, and so there's going to be uh, an issue starting in September. I just want to piggyback on that. I know at our budget, <coughs> uh, you reminded me, I had mentioned that as well. I think that was one of my concerns. I know we can't uh, replicate the ASPE program. We know that. But what, op what opportunities can we provide students who want to explore or look at a trade or some other medical piece? Um, and I think that is something we have to be very mindful of when we look at some new initiatives or things that we can add, particularly at the high school level for students, because that mm -hmm. is going, if it goes as we think is going to be um, students who really want that exposure, and we should be trying to find something for them as well. Okay, uh, I do agree with my my colleagues. I will say, um, you know, the, the good news story here is that there is no budget gap. Um, we've talked for years uh, about you know whatever the next gap was. You know, going back two years ago, prior to COVID, at this very time we were facing a two million dollar budget gap. Just after. We had another two million, and then you know, as my colleagues have said a year ago at this time, what a difference a year makes. It was 4.5 million. That was the financial cliff. So, of all the challenges that this district has experienced over the last two years, and especially the new challenges that we've had uh, this year, many of them frustrating. Uh, it's good that financial challenges are not one of them, uh, and that you know, as was referenced by my colleagues with regards to our budget workshop last week. It was an awkward experience as a school committee member in a good way uh, to actually be talking about adding resources in critical areas, uh, you know, many of them in the mental health space as we've been talking about. Uh, certainly our needs uh, are much different than they were two years ago. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, the needs assessment that Dr. Sawyer and his senior leadership team did um, to bring these recommendations forward. Um, uh, also, obviously, uh, as was stated, I'm very supportive of any uh, recommendation to remove uh, any type of fees to encourage you know more students to join activities and after school programs uh, and again as, as was stated uh, just thanks to the community at large for their support uh, for all town services as a result of the override and certainly thank you to this board for all the dedication uh, you know that, that that showed last year along with our town manager Kevin Mizikar and his financial leadership and the partnership uh, that we built with the Board of Selectmen all of which has been a tremendous game changer as was evidence uh, in this presentation tonight and thank you to Mr. Collins uh, for his great work in putting together uh, that uh, recap uh, and to Dr. Sawyer as well. Any further comments Dr. Sawyer? No I appreciate the feedback we'll definitely take that under advisement and uh, present more information to you as we go through the process. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes, the minutes from the school committee meeting held on February 2nd, uh, and the school committee workshop held on February 9th were enclosed. Any edits or revisions to reports? Uh, there being none, uh, they will be accepted as written. Uh, we do need to enter into executive session tonight. Um, and therefore, I will need a motion that the school committee 
enter into executive session uh, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, Purpose 7, Open Meeting Law, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 22 F and G, for the purposes of reviewing, approving, and or releasing executive session minutes, and B, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect of the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares purpose three, the Shrewsbury Education Association units A and or B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessionals Association and or the Cafeteria Workers Association, and C, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, purpose two, where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. So moved. So, second. Moved and seconded. Roll call vote is required. Mr. Palich? Aye. Dr. McGee? Aye. Ms. Fritz? Aye. Ms. Heffernan? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you and good night. Minute and 20 seconds that took.